Yeah, we decided to finish it off because we were at chapter 17 and my brain can't count inclusively. So I didn't realize that meant we were reading four chapters instead of three. <laughs> it's five. Yeah. Um, but um, luckily the chapters were kind of short and action packed. So <laughs> it wasn't a lot. It was just, um, so for any viewers out there, I took a trip up to Mount Tam because of course that's where this editing takes place. And I'm right here in the Bay Area. So I thought I might as well. Um, and so on the way up, I read this ending and I was bawling in the back of the, like I was trying to have a conversation with my brother. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait, hold on, hold on. And he's just like, that is a mark of a good book. <laughs> yeah. I was like, when you said you were reading chapter 18, I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, so um, where we left off, they had already gotten to Mount Tam. They, um, they saw Luke, Atlas, and this one just brings us right into the climax of that whole situation. So the first chapter we read is basically the battle that happens at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I have to trigger you right away because I know one of the very first lines. Um, it was something that, that uh, Percy says about Zoe when he is looking at Atlas and he says, he was all of the things I'd originally disliked about Zoe with none of the good I'd come to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that, and especially the line that she looked like him. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, God. <laughs> I look, I look like my dad. For anyone who doesn't actually know me, I like before I got TikTok, I never looked at my own face because I look so much like him. I still hardly take photos of my actual face. And some days after I have EMDR, I don't make like videos with my face because I don't want, I don't want to look at myself because my own face triggers me, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, that happens sometimes. So when he said that, I was like, yeah, that's a thing that happens sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, like, and my mom is nowhere near the monster that Atlas or your dad were, but there are times when I hear her voice in my voice or I see, like, little mannerisms in my face that remind me of her. And when you are unpacking trauma that came from a certain parent, those things like they get to you they, they really do and you'll be like shit did I just talk and my mom came out yeah that's um when I was more like early on with therapy I would know when I was going too far when I sounded like my mom or my dad but especially like my dad I would be like whoa okay <laughs> I need to like I would that would be like my moment of like I need to stop talking and that's when I would like stop talking to somebody when I was still like figuring that stuff out <laughs> when I sounded when I heard them and I was like whoa I sound way too much like them I need to like <laughs> like right now like let's stop this right now um god this whole end chapter this whole end of the book is just so hard when you've gone through anything similar to this at all because it's just all so very aggressive and it like it will feel very good to talk about it all um and i do genuinely think it's absolutely hilarious that i've seen multiple videos this week of people trying to say that luke isn't a predator after just this one chapter alone yeah this was disgusting <laughs> like yeah. i I, I did not remember this being this disgusting when I read these books for the first time because I was not aware enough then that it was how bad it actually was but for him and um, Annabeth and Thalia. Um, but I don't even think we've gotten to that part yet. Um, yeah, there's like not a single character in this last chapter that we've been following that is spared from the trauma, including Grover. <laughs> and he's not even there. <laughs> Poor little girl. Yeah. I know. Um, Jesus. Okay, what's what's like the next thing that happens in chronological order? Because there's so much stuff. Yeah. So, um, let's see. We have Zoe offering to take the load from Artemis. Artemis says no. And then um, Annabeth kind of like signaling to Percy. She's motioning her head to Luke, which I don't know what that's supposed to be at all. 
I don't um, want to know. <laughs> yeah, especially because of the things she says once she's not chained up anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, let's see. And then he notices that she has the gray streak in her hair. Um, so that is the mark that she received basically from holding up the sky because the strain should have killed her. Mm -hmm. Um, and then let's see, um, so from there, he says, um, why can't Artemis just let go? And Atlas explains how holding up the sky is a curse. And I was trying to look in the mythology to see if it's described in the same way. Like, yes, Atlas was punished for being basically the general of the Titans is what I would call him even in mythology. But it's never described so um, so detailed as like a curse where they put rules on it in this chapter. They say, you know, it, it can only be forced on a Titan and anyone else has to take it willingly. Which I thought was like, it's an interesting thing to add to it, but we'll have to circle back to who can hold up the sky because that does come back later, like at the very end. Um, let's see. And then what I found really interesting was how, how easily Percy starts challenging Atlas because they haven't had a lot of time together. I mean, like, Obviously, he's been triggered by gods before. He was triggered by Dionysus earlier in the book. He's had his fight with Ares. Um, he hasn't had that with Atlas yet, but still, he's right away like, fight me, coward. Yeah. I've, once you deal with one abusive person, you just know how to handle them all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, Percy knows how to handle somebody like Atlas. It's very easy to make them angry. You just, like, talk in their general direction about their ego and they just become like a raging little baby yeah yeah so he calls him a coward um but the what we get reminded of in the battle is that atlas can't directly challenge him percy has to be the one to challenge atlas in order for like the rules to follow and so um percy just kind of walks right into it i hate to say but i I get it. He's watching everybody else around him. And I feel like it's not said explicitly, but Zoe right here is who he is fighting on behalf. Oh, yeah. And it's just very Percy to just like, well, I'll just sacrifice myself. That's fine. Um, yeah. Why not? <laughs> Everyone else yeah. is too busy being groomed by Luke at the moment. So I'll just do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I think it's Atlas who says it. No, it's Luke who starts then trying to get Talia on board. And what he tells her is, you can still join us, call the Ophiotaurus, meaning Bessie, and it'll come to you. Just go ahead. And so they make a pool of water appear, and you can start kind of seeing Bessie show up, but then Grover's voice appears in Percy's head, and he's like, don't think about him. I'm about to lose him. Stop. Stop thinking about him. And so Percy's like, oh my gosh, um, um, baseball. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Ashley said that the kids having to initiate the fights is a whole like, see, you started this fight, so you can't be mad at me thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely like, it's your fault. This, that this happened to you made me do this. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> 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 That just goes in line with how the gods are abusive little assholes. So of yeah. course they would be like, oh, you have, to, if you started, then I'm allowed to chop your head off because I have no choice after this, obviously. Well, and okay. So I feel like this is where people get it twisted. You have been fighting the Luke defenders for like a week straight. It feels like, yeah. Um, but since Luke is the one trying to coax Talia into it, he says, if you join me, it can be like the old times, the three of us together fighting for a better world. Please, Talia, if you don't agree, his voice faltered. It's my last chance. Um, he will use the other way if you don't agree, which my interpretation of this is he's saying, if you don't do this, then I have to continue to deteriorate and take on his body. He's literally like, if you don't do this, I have to, and I don't want to. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be able to ruin the entire world 
and have nothing actually happen to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, because the other way is that I have to house this evil motherfucker in my own body and I can't manipulate anyone else to do it for me. That is the great tragedy here. That yeah. like Luke would actually have to follow through with the decisions that he's made in his life. And he's like, save me from my own horrible choices. And it's like, no. Yeah. No. And, um, let's see. Percy says, I didn't know what he meant, but the fear in his voice sounded real enough. I believed that Luke was in danger. His life depended on Talia joining his cause. So like Percy is getting the same thing from this, that Luke is going to die or something really bad is going to happen to him if he can't get her on board. And we also have to remember, this is like a day before her birthday, her 16th birthday, which means the prophecy could happen immediately if she were to say yes. Yeah, this part when they're like, he's trying so hard to tempt her and he's like, here's a fire that can kill Bessie. Why don't you just go do it? It's just, it's genuinely like terrifying about how good he is at this. Mm -hmm. Like he is so good at this. He's so good at knowing what to say to them to get them to do what he wants and it's so close to working mm -hmm. it's like scary genuinely like the only way that um ashley's still here the only and she said this to me this week and it's very true that the only way that percy and luke are actually like mirrors of each other is that they both have like emotional intelligence but mm -hmm. percy has that and feels empathetic towards everyone including people like luke right there who are trying to kill him and luke uses that intelligence to try to get what he can out of people and manipulate the hell out of them every chance he gets that's the only way that they're actually mirrors of each other is by what they use how they use that intelligence that they have about people's emotions okay. and things like that but that's that's it but it's genuinely terrifying how good he is at it like that he's on the top of this mountain almost crying trying to convince somebody that he was just laughing at because, oh, I tried to kill you before you came back. Isn't that funny that I'm now talking to you now? And then five minutes later, he's like almost crying and she's actually taking him seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't know. I We do eventually get some good things from Talia, but um, I feel like she needs to sit with this for a second. The reality of what Luke is because she hasn't acknowledged that he literally tried to kill her in tree form like she's i mean she doesn't even in this book but um i feel like seeing him physically change and kind of in her head at least a little bit understanding what's happening that something's taking over his body and it's not really him that is what snaps her out of it and and makes her like finally like this isn't luke and my favorite thing that Thalia ever does is when she kicks him off of a cliff. Yeah. And especially, you don't, you can't do this. You can't do this to me. I'm just going to kill you. And he's like, she's like, anyway, go yes. away. Like, it, just get away from me. <laughs> Thank God. And of course, like that moment gets like ruined because Annabeth is all upset and that she did that and it's like nobody touched luke nobody hurt luke nobody do anything to luke and i'm like i'm sorry is this not the guy that just almost killed you yeah but you're so focused on him i genuinely wanted to vomit when i was reading this stuff about i was like this is fucking disgusting about how easy it is for her to be manipulated by him it's a fucking joke like i don't mean to sound like victim blaming anyway but this is just one of those things that gets to me because i had a very abusive person in my life that tried to turn me into a very bad person and i told him to go fuck himself mm -hmm. and there were definitely some things that i did through the years that weren't that great but i fought him as hard as humanly possible as you can to fight another person and so whenever I see somebody that just is like giving in so easily, I'm just like, I want to like shake them and be like, stop it. Stop. You're supposed to like fight against people like this. You're not supposed to like fall for them, but like everything about her makes it so easy for her to fall into his trap. She just thinks she's too smart yeah. to be used like that, but she's not, it doesn't matter. 
Yeah, so we get his villain monologue too, which I thought it was really funny that he does get a villain monologue. He says, we're going to raise Mount Orthus right here. Um, it'll be more stronger and greater than Olympus. And then um, monsters start climbing up the side of the mountain and he says, this is only a taste of what is to come. Soon we will be ready to storm Camp Path Blood, and after that, Olympus itself. All we need is your help. Which, like, we're excusing him going to storm Camp Half That's his friends. You know, he was like a leader in Camp Half Blood. Most of the kids are probably in his cabin because they haven't been claimed, or because I'm, they're Hermes kids, but mostly because they haven't been claimed. And everybody starts out in his cabin. You know, it's just he has seen all of these kids more intimately and he is ready to storm camp half blood first that is something that is inexcusable and it's why both of us maintain that luke is not redeemable at this point no he was not redeemable before this point anyway but he especially isn't when you're talking like this like your plan is to go and show up and kill everybody who still looks up to you Mm -hmm. and then and then but i thought your whole reason why you were doing this is was to help all the kids at camp yeah you so want to storm camp and kill them all is that and what you even doing? accomplish like that's the thing is what does it accomplish it makes him supreme ruler of the universe <laughs> and like like uh that not exaggerating that's like what he what he actually wants like we're we'll talk we're gonna do like a whole other you know grooming episode more about this but just to like put it simply like the luke doesn't see a problem with the way that the gods rule the world necessarily mm -hmm. he just thinks that it's a problem that the gods are the one in charge of things this way he thinks that if he was the one that had all of that power that everything would be better he doesn't have a problem with somebody like ruling over everybody and controlling everyone he just thinks that he should be the one to do it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't see an issue though with the way that they're really, that they have that much power in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's, that just says a lot about him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the political back and forth that people get into. Mm -hmm. And the problem isn't who's in control, although there's definitely an answer on who should be in control, you know, coming up, but there shouldn't be that much power. That's part of the problem to start with. So um, he's he's of the stance, it seems like, oh, it just needs to be the right people. It just needs to be the strongest people, which like he's going from his negligent Olympian parent to someone who literally ate his children, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> I just go back to the movie of, ooh, grandchild, yummy. I love it when I eat my children early in the morning before indigestion kicks in. <laughs> like, it's just... Yeah. Like, what's going to stop him from eating you, Luke? I mean, he literally is kind of, in a way. I just love that there's seriously people out there in the world that are like, Luke had no <laughs> choice but to groom these minor children that he knew looked up to him and then like make like a, a nut, like a plan with a guy that is so evil that he was cut up into a tiny million little pieces mm -hmm. and he has no choice because that's the only way to save everybody apparently is mm -hmm. to be friends with the worst person that has ever existed in the history of the world apparently i did well, not know that <laughs> so this is where the kids I mean talia has her moment of you aren't luke i don't know you anymore and he says don't make me don't make him destroy you and that's when percy is like we're running out of time there's monsters climbing up the mountain and if we don't move soon then we're going to be outnumbered and it says he met annabeth's eyes and she nodded which like she's still chained up too but she's kind of it's interesting that she's helping them with the battle strategy even just unspoken mm -hmm. definitely an athena girl mm -hmm. um but then as they're fighting, Talia goes straight for Luke. And so I feel like that is the moment she actually did make her decision of like, I'm not going with him. Whatever's happening to him is scary and awful. And I don't like the things he's saying. No, like, I don't actually know this dude anymore. Yeah. 
Um, so, and it says that when she went for him, it was such a, um, you know, like her shield made the dragon women bodyguards that were standing next to him and also holding the sarcophagus back up. Like she scared everybody with the force that she went at him. Um, and Percy decided that he was going to attack Atlas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. So yeah, Percy tries to warn, or sorry, Zoe tries to warn him, but um, it's, he does not care. He was just like, if I die, I die because I'm probably going to die anyway. Literally like Zoe and Percy talking to each other is just two scapegoats being like, I want to sacrifice myself. No, I want to sacrifice my, this entire last scene is just the two of them basically like sacrificing themselves to save everybody else's asses. Um, exactly. It's literally just them. <laughs> yeah. And um, so Percy gets knocked on his butt right away, you know, so he swings at Atlas. Atlas knocks him back with, it says the shaft of his javelin. So I'm imagining just like sweeping almost like a bat motion. And then he slams into what is Mount Orthus, which he thought was like a mist illusion before, but it's definitely not one now. And um, it's kind of becoming real as they're in this battle. Um, let's see. And I also thought it was interesting that this is what gives Percy like another jolt of I'm going to act was that Atlas says, did you think simply because you can challenge that petty god, uh, petty war god that you could stand up to me? The mention of Ares sent a jolt through me. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, now I'm angry all over again because fuck yeah. Ares. And like remembering what Ares said during their fight that his sword wouldn't work in the most, like me, the moment he needed it most. And he's like, well, crap, that's right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm so fighting Titan his sword is suddenly like super heavy or something's wrong with his arm it's hard to tell but he says that he could not lift it anymore and um let's see so because he was slammed into the ground he's at the feet of artemis and she's telling him to run away but as he's thinking you know like my sword um it's gotten away from me at this point i can't lift it for some reason um, and also, you know, like I need to do something. So he remembers the part of the prophecy where it says the Titans curse one must withstand. And so he realizes he's standing there next to Artemis, like, oh yeah, one of us has to tap Artemis in. Yeah. 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 Um, and I feel like this moment is probably the moment where Artemis starts respecting him because I think it's really poetic that like for a second there, they're both sharing the weight before he lets it shift completely onto himself. And even just holding half of it, he's like, I'm ready to black out. I'm going to throw up like this is awful. And um, then he just like tries to breathe through it. I can do this. I can do this. And he is fighting every muscle in his body to the point where, you know, it seems like he's going to just melt under it. And then he hears Grover's voice, fight back, don't give up. Um, they don't say it in this book, and they haven't said it yet in this series, but we know that empathy link also links their lives. And so Grover is probably in some way feeling this strain as well. Yeah. I... This part is also one of those things of why I love like Percy as a character is that earlier in this book when they were fighting like the Nemean lion, uh -huh. he could like just think on his feet. Uh -huh. Like another time of that of like, I don't need to be the one to beat like this Titan. Like I don't care if I'm the one to beat him or not. So if it means that I have to do this in order for us to win, all I care about is us winning. Mm -hmm. So I'll just like do this so that somebody else can do it because I don't actually care about like my ego <laughs> or anything like that. I don't need to be the one to do it. Um, and just, of course, one thing that b annoys me is that when people talk about this, a lot of it become it's become like a weird meme 
that people are like, oh, why does everyone make a big deal about Percy doing it for when he only does it for a little bit when Annabeth does it for like a lot longer? And it's like because he knew going into it what would happen, he knew what he was doing. He knew how painful it was. He knew that he was likely going to die when if he was holding it. And like Annabeth didn't know any of that. She was tricked into doing it. And like, yeah, it is amazing that she held it for as long as she did before she was about to die. Um, mm -hmm. But still, like she was tricked into that by Luke. He knew what was going to happen and he did it anyway. That is a lot harder to do, to know that you're, if you do this, I'm probably going to die and how painful it will be, but you just do it anyway. Like that's way harder when you know what's about to happen. Like that's why people make such a big deal about him holding up the sky because he's one of the only characters so far that actually knew what that actually meant. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and also, when you think about it strategically, it puts him in a vulnerable position, too, because his arms are, are busy, his legs are busy. He can't even really think at this point. And so if somebody wanted to just let the, you know, like let Uranus and Gaia meet again, they could just take him out right there because he's super vulnerable. Even like after he gets out. Like he like tries to stand up and just falls back over because his body hurts so much that he can't even stand up or anything for even after they leave for a while when they're like leaving, he's still talking about how much his body hurts. So like if anything found them again at the, at any point, he wouldn't have been able to fight them off after that because it, it would have been too hard. Um, and he just did it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I also thought it was interesting that while he is trying to fight back and like stay alive, essentially, while he's holding this weight, he says, I thought about Bianca, who had given her life so we could get here. If she could do that, I could hold the sky. Sweetheart. He's so that's sweet. Why, that's why the idea that his fatal flaw is caring about the people he cares about is ludicrous. Like, we'll get into that much later with Athena's stupid ass. But it's ludicrous like the reason why he's able to survive holding up the sky is because of grover in his head like connecting him to just like actual humanity when you're at like a point where you can't even think straight and remembering like you know bianca and her giving him like strength to like feel like this was worth something and to keep going um that can never be a bad thing no matter what happens <laughs> yeah um so he, the fight is a blur to him at this point because he's just focused on holding up the sky, but he says it looks like Athena, or no, sorry, Artemis is a blur of silver turning into different animals as she's fighting. And um, some of the animals he names is a tiger, a gazelle, a bear, a falcon. Um, but he's not sure if this is just a fever dream for him or it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. We then jump to Talia and Luke fighting again, um, which, I mean, this also is unsaid, but theoretically, they would know each other's fighting styles very well because they probably practice together a lot. Like, both of them seem like the type to be, like, you know, playfully wanting to be better than the other in practice. And so she probably knows his vulnerabilities. He probably knows hers. And um, yet they're still kind of at it, even though Luke is, you know, he looks awful. He looks like he shouldn't be able to fight at this point. Um, and it is back and forth the entire time. Um, let's see. And then we get to Artemis speaking in his head. And she, he realizes what she's trying to do. All she says is get ready in his head. Um, and he, it says, I was losing my ability to think through the pain. My response was something like, oh, <laughs> um, and so Artemis tricks, um, let's see, wait, before she does that, it says, um, Atlas fainted with the tip of his javelin and Ar Artemis dodged. I saw the trick coming. Atlas's javelin swept around and knocked Artemis's leg off the ground. She fell and Atlas brought up his javelin tip for the kill. And that's when Zoe jumps in. Um, let's see. So she shoots an arrow 
lodges in his forehead. She, he says it looks like a unicorn horn. And then he sweeps aside his daughter and sends her flying into the rocks. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, where do we go from here? Um, Artemis is wounded. Zoe's wounded. Um, and then Artemis finally eventually does trick Atlas into getting into a position where Percy can then try to shift the weight onto him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it says, I loosened my grip on the sky, and as Atlas slammed into me, I didn't try to hold on. I let myself be pushed out of the way and rolled for all I was worth. So not even standing at this point. He has to roll out of the way because I'm sure his legs are shot. Yeah, he can't. He can't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which then puts Atlas stuck under the burden again. Thank goodness. Yes. So right after that is when Talia has Luke backed up to the cliff. And um, let's see, he lunged at Talia and she slammed him with her shield. Luke's sword spun out of his hands and clattered the rocks. Talia put her spear point to his throat. For a moment there was silence. And so because she hesitates to kill him, I think that this is where he thinks, no, I still got her. And, um, you know, Annabeth in the back is like, please don't kill him. Please don't kill him. And Talia is like, he's a traitor. He, he's a traitor, <laughs> like with the javelin point still on him. And Luke tries to grab it at one point. And when he's trying to grab it from her, that's when she kicks him off the mountain. <laughs> That's like um, one of my why it was one of my favorite moments because it's such a st there's usually like that stereotypical like villain moment of like you can't take you can't kill me you don't have the guts to kill me and that's usually the moment when like the good person usually doesn't have the guts to kill them and this time she's like no I can kill you <laughs> and, and just kicks him off the mountain and it would have otherwise killed him if he didn't have like Kronos inside of his body, making him like immortal and things like that, that we know of from reading the other books already. But without that, he definitely would have died. Yeah. And um, even though she had this moment of strength, realizing like the weight of what just happened, she is paralyzed for a second after this. She is, um, you know, like crying, tears streaming down her cheeks and just standing still. Um, let's see. I can't remember if that's when the, the, is that when they start coming up? I think that's when it seems like the army is getting closer and closer. That's climbing up the mountain. Um, Artemis had gone to Zoe at this point and Artemis can't really heal her on her own because the wound that Zoe has is poisoned which confuses Percy at first because he's like, wait, how did Atlas poison her? And then he realizes that the entire time, back when they were with Ladon before they got up the mountain, she got scratched or bitten or something like that. I forgot which, and that poisoned her. So she had been doing this entire battle so far, the hike, which is very steep, <laughs> while she was dealing with poison. Mm-hmm um let's see and as the monsters are coming over the hill all of a sudden a world war one plane shows up a sop with camel and so i looked up just like a tiny bit of info about this it was a british world war one plane and what's interesting about it is that it was a very very successful plane like it took down a lot of enemies but at the same time it caused a lot of accidents because it's very, very hard to fly. So this is a tribute almost to Dr. Chase that he's able to fly it. And you just know that nerdy ass man was like flying all around San Francisco with it to practice because he knew that he knew that it was a simple plane to fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's, he's on his biplane and he's screaming, get away from my daughter. And he starts shooting at the monsters and it starts actually going through them which surprises everybody because it's they think it's a mortal like machine gun that he's operating on this plane um annabeth's just like dad 
you know, like my dad is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's when they start running. Let's see. Um, as he's fighting the, um, the monsters, that's when Artemis decides that she is going to call her chariot and they all board and fly away. Um, and it, one thing that was kind of funny about it was um, Percy remarks that it's like Santa's sleigh. And she's like, where do you think that came from? Yeah. And it's like, can we not talk about that right now? <laughs> yeah. So they're able to escape by air from this battle um, without really, well, they've, they've disarmed Atlas in a way. Luke, they're not sure the fate of at this point, but all of the monsters are probably descending, the, are ascending the mountain and like, well, shit, we missed them. Mm -hmm. I just picture them getting up there and being like, where do they go? <laughs> um, so all of them land in Chrissy Field eventually, which is where we get a little conversation between Annabeth and her dad. Um, what we find out is why the bullets actually worked on the, the monsters, which is that Annabeth had left a bunch of half-blood weapons at their house in Virginia. And so her dad melted them down and he says he made bullet casings out of them. Bullet casings are like the the back part. So I would think he meant like the actual front part of the bullet because I think the back part just drops off after it's shot. So yeah, I think Rick Riordan's just not, not up to date, um, which like I can excuse, he's an English teacher. He's a soft guy. Um, but what I'm thinking is, if you look at a bullet, like the very tip of it, that would probably need to be what celestial bronze so that it can go through the monster. Um, and yeah, so he says, just a little experiment, like it's no big deal. And um, Percy is like, this is probably why Athena likes him. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely why. Mm -hmm. um, so... They're kind of talking about, can Zoe be saved at this point now that they're in safety again? And she can't, you know, like there's the poison, but also Percy is realizing that it's not just the poison. She was knocked back into some rocks. So there's probably some internal damage that is a little bit harder to fix. And they don't have nectar, they don't have ambrosia. It would take them too long to get somewhere safely. So like this is about to be it yeah there's the um i don't know what to call it like the symbolism or whatever when it comes to like scapegoats is very aggressive during this chapter with not only percy literally taking on the weight of the world mm -hmm. instead of it being like a metaphorical weight of the world like it usually is he takes it literally mm -hmm. on um for other people and then with Zoe, like the fact that that she basically died because of her dad, regardless. Like even if he wasn't the one who actually killed her. He was the one that made. Like she didn't care about what happened to her because she was so sure that her dad would kill her, and so she just like instigated Ladon basically on purpose. So it was because she just doesn't care. She's like, yeah, my dad's probably gonna kill me anyway. So if I get poisoned by this dragon at least technically my dad didn't kill me but i'm gonna die anyway so i don't care about myself enough to stop this from happening to me and it's just like an aggressive that really sucks <laughs> to like put it lightly just the whole thing because that is very much how you feel like why am i trying like why, why am i doing this when they have so much power over me and they're never gonna let me live my own life um, there's like a thousand different times that if somebody would have let, like, been like, here, have some poison, I would have been like, okay. Like, yeah. then I don't, then I, then I can just die and nobody will have to, like, and I won't have to actually deal with this anymore. That would be really nice. Um, <laughs> but it's still really sad that she just kind of gives in to, to it in a way, or like just doesn't try to, like, save herself leading up to this moment because she was so, it's one of those sad things that they ended up beating him. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so if she wouldn't have done that, she might have actually survived this. But she was so sure that she wouldn't that she just did it because it, the prophecy does say that one of them has to die by a parent's hand. And she knew the entire time that it was going to be her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no way she didn't know that, like, when people were saying the general that they met her dad. And so she went on the quest knowing this was going to happen. A little iffy, she brought Bianca on the quest knowing this is going to happen. But she basically was like, okay, well, if I'm going to die anyway, it's going to be when we finally meet him, which probably isn't going to be till the end. So I have all of this time to train Bianca before we get there. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what I think is interesting too is that one of the first things she says as she's realizing she's dying first is, "Did I serve you well, Artemis?" And Artemis is like, "Yes, you did." Um, then second is she looks at Talia and she's like, "I'm so I'm so sorry we fought. We could have been sisters." And Talia says, "It's my fault. I should have never listened to you. You were right about Luke." Um, about heroes, about men, everything. <laughs> and, and that prompts her to look at Percy. And she's like, no, I wasn't right. Like, not all of them. And um, she says, do you still have the sword? He basically starts almost handing it to her. And she's like, I'm very proud that you're the person holding this sword. You're nothing like Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> My heart. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, I've got to give to Thalia a lot of credit because she is pretty terrible to Percy this whole book, but at least at the end she realizes much quicker than almost anyone else. Like, yeah, he was actually right about this. You were right about this. I was the one that was wrong. I can I can at least admit it in this moment that I was wrong for holding out hope for Luke this whole time. Mm-hmm. <sighs> um, so... Um, one of the last things that Zoe says is that she can see the stars again, because er earlier she was like, I can't see the stars. Um, and then she passes and Artemis is crying. Um, she, then it's, it almost seems like it must be whatever ritual, because we hear about it in mythology of people getting stellified. Um, there's countless myths of mortals that um that gods fell in love with or that like heroes that fell or things like that that can get turned into constellations so we see it actually happening and and the way artemis does it is that zoe takes her final breath and it's almost like she catches it and um she holds it in her hand she breathes into it and then she releases it into the sky and at first you don't notice anything but then percy says there is what looks like the shape of a girl holding a bow and that is where zoe gets to stay forever and like just um one of the things about this book is that it has such like long-lasting effects on percy and annabeth mm-hmm. um so one thing i did want to bring up is that I can't remember if they see her, but when they're in the Heroes of Olympus series and they get out of um, Tartarus, they go and Percy is like looking at the constellations and there's somebody that they that helps them that tells them like, just go say hi to like the stars for me. And he says that looking up at them, but he like brings up, they bring up Zoe in the Heroes of Olympus books which are like many, many books after this. And they bring her up because he hates Hercules and the other kids, the younger kids who don't know him and think that he's just like this weird angsty person don't understand why he hates Hercules. Um, Mm. But he absolutely hates him and goes on a whole rant about how much he hates him. (laughs) And the rest of them are like, but wait. I thought you don't you don't like him how do you not like him and he's like I fucking hate that guy (laughs) like if he could say fuck in those books he would when talking about Hercules and stuff and so it's something that that Percy and Annabeth bring up like more like years and years later they still are thinking about Zoe and what she went through and how she didn't deserve any of it yeah and it's 
It's interesting how we got from, you know, she is a cold bitch in the beginning to just, no, she's a very hurt individual and she is trying her best here. She has been trying her best for centuries. And so it's almost like she, she embraced death. And I know you were saying it's a scapegoaty thing, but she embraced it because like all of that was finally resolved. The trauma with the hero was was fixed in a way and like she had her final showdown with her dad and saw her dad got punished again so i i feel like that's as much closure as she could have hoped for yeah like she basically like ran away from her dad and her family as soon as she could after Mm -hmm. they black sheeped her out and so after that she just like never dealt with them and just tried to get away from them and never and just like avoid that confrontation for as long as possible and now that it's finally over it's like okay well now i like finished all of this stuff and so if i die i i can die yeah yeah it's still sad i was i was she was growing on me especially at the end but i love um, like uh People really love Zoe, and this is like why she's such a good, she's such a good character. Like you understand, the more you know her, I feel like the more it like gets to you. Like, um, like I forget what chapter we were reading where they were talking about constellations, and you were like, "Oh, why does Percy not know that these constellations can be real?" And I was just like, "Yep." <laughs> because I just like didn't want to think about it of why Rick Riordan put in them even talking about the stars at all <laughs> during mm-hmm. that part with with um with Zoe because the more you know about her the more like upset you get like when I was reading this book and I knew all these things I was just so upset reading it all because I was mm-hmm. just like she knows that she's gonna go after her dad and this whole time and it's probably why she was so like get me out of camp right now because she knew who had artemis the whole time yeah that it just makes everything she does just like you have a lot of empathy for her when you realize what was really going on the whole time yeah um and i love the final words there that artemis says let the world honor you my huntress live forever in the stars mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the part that made me cry on the drive. Yeah. Um, so after that, they take off from Chrissy Field. They say Mount Tam it looks like there's lightning and, and stuff still happening there. Um, but Artemis has to go to Olympus and she sends for a ride for everybody else. And that's when three Pegasi come in, one being Blackjack. And he's like, oh, yeah, I brought Guido and Pork Pie with me. <laughs> um, let's see. So, um, they are questioning Dr. Chase while they're like, are we going to have to take that mortal? Who is he? Like, do, do we need to get him for you? <laughs> and Dr. Chase is just like, oh my God, those things are so fascinating. I actually ha- asked my brother about this one. So he says, why, if the British had had these Pegasi and the cavalry charges in the Crimea, Dr. Chase said, the charge of the light brigade. And so I was like asking my brother, what is that? He said, it's a battle where the British were surrounded on three sides and they were heavily massacred. So of course, if they had been able to just fly up, that wouldn't have happened. It is just very much an autistic person. Mm -hmm. In this moment of his exact life, this is what he's thinking about. (laughs) He's like my special interest. How can I incorporate this? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So they take off on the Pegasi back for Manhattan. And so it seems like Annabeth is on Guido, Percy is on Blackjack, and Talia is on Pork Pie. And surprisingly, even though she's been afraid of heights this whole time, she falls asleep. And cute little Pork Pie is like adjusting himself as he's flying so she doesn't fall off because she's just dead asleep. They're so sweet. I, I love the Pegasus. Um, there's one line that is like not even that big of a deal, but mm-hmm. sent me into like, uh, like rage for a little bit yeah. <laughs> because of like scapegoat things during this part, which is when Percy and Annabeth are talking mm-hmm. and um, 
she, Annabeth says like, oh, thank you for, you know, coming to save me. Okay. And it, um, and is, you know, like, did you think I was dead? And he's like, no, why would I think that you were dead? But he, but the line that killed me is when he was like, oh yeah, it's no big deal. We're friends. And I was just like, <laughs> I'm going to like die that. <sighs> So this is like a, a bigger conversation, but um, it's just like one of those things from this book that he does everything he does in this book to try to help her, to try to save her, to try to do anything to help her. Some gods are like telling him that they ship him with her and then he shows up and all she can talk about is Luke and all she cares about is Luke and everything is about Luke. I know that he's still alive, like the way that you knew that I was still alive. And it's like, of course, he's going to say, oh, it's no big deal. We're just friends and going to act like everything he did doesn't matter. And it's not a huge deal or anything like that, because why would he think after that, that he matters to her? Mm -hmm. He is everything is about Luke and nothing is about him. Like it's. One of the things with this them going forward that bothers me in the next book is how people talk about it as if like, oh, Percy is oblivious to his feelings or him and Rachel are the reasons why they don't get along and I'm, don't get together. And I'm like, this is why A after everything he just did and all she can talk about is wanting to save Luke and says she feels connected to Luke the way that he feels connected to her why would he ever think that she has romantic feelings for him that are more powerful than the feelings she has for the dude grooming her yeah. like he's not like he's not somebody that like is ever going to like bust into a situation if he thinks that somebody else is happy with something else like this entire book is him doing whatever he can to keep everyone else happy even if it's at the cost of himself so he's never going to be the one that's like hey what about me if he thinks that that's what she wants, he's just going to let her, he's going to be like upset in his head, knowing that like Luke is never going to be saved and that this is going to end in like massive disaster, which is basically what he does. But yeah. he's never going to go out of his way to like bring this up, even if he was aware of how he felt at this point, like he's aware of how he feels, but I don't know why he would think that she feels that way about him considering what's going on. And it's just, a good example of how when some an older person is manipulating you and abusing you, how much mm -hmm. of a disaster your life becomes and you start doing things that are not what you actually want to do or not what you actually care about. Because you just get so wrapped up in their stuff that you end up doing like, I don't think that Annabeth actually cares about Luke more than she cares about Percy, but she's giving that idea off and it continues on for a while after this. And I don't think that she even realizes necessarily what she's doing, but I think she's almost like confused of like, I want to protect Luke, but also every time she says that she's like spitting in like Percy's face basically. And like, doesn't seem to be, oh, she's not aware enough that she's doing it to stop it. And so she just, they just get stuck in this cycle of like, I don't know what you wanted him to do. Uh, why would, he, why would he make a bigger deal about that? if this is the reaction he's getting now. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully when season three gets greenlit, I feel like this is going to change how most people feel about Luke and what he does to her, because I can just see, you know, like scenes happening where, you know, that like trope that they do when someone's held captive and it's like, well, I'm going to be the person to give them food and to like tie them up because I care about them, so I'm not going to do it, you know, like, I'm not going to tie them up too tight. I'm going to, um, you know, like, lovingly place a gag in their mouth and, and shit like that. Like, it's going to be that kind of thing where he's sweet-talking her while holding her captive because he's, he's trying to manipulate her into, like, I'm just trying to make all of the things we wanted happen happen and, and you know, like, I don't know how else we can do this. And he's going to be saying all of the things to get her on board with him. Yeah. And um, I'm sure this kind of stuff he was saying is like, remember what it was like before you knew Percy and everything was 
much simpler and I never would have done this if you were at camp instead of on a quest with Percy and and things like that too because she is very like she's a lot more aggressive with Percy in the fourth book about this sort of stuff um so I think that that's the kind of stuff he would say and then also just in the way that he talked to Thalia and the and that Annabeth was like, oh, we can bring him back to Olympus. He'll be like useful there. And I'm like, what, yeah, how? what use would he have there? He wants to kill everybody who's there. <laughs> and, but also like, I just don't know what would be you, but that's like, he must've said things that made like the things he was saying to Thalia, but probably a lot more and a lot worse to make her believe that like, oh, he's just doing this because of whatever. And he's in a lot of pain and we need to like, fix his pain um and things like that and it's like oh my god (laughs) yeah and i mean this goes back to you fighting the luke defenders we're not meant to sympathize with him here we're meant to be thinking how is she saying that after everything that just happened how is she still like this after everything she just went through but it it should it should be like shocking that that like Percy was like not eating and not sleeping because he was so scared of the nightmares he was having about her being tortured by Luke. And they were like rushing so much to try to get to her to save her before she was killed by Luke. And then when they get there, all she can do is try to protect him. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like the, the word like Stockholm syndrome because that's just, like PTSD and a and a trauma bond basically like an actual trauma bond not the way that like the internet talks about trauma bonds as if it's like a good thing but like the actual like destructive word of a trauma bond where you feel like you need to protect the other person that's hurting you the most because you think that you can't make decisions in your life without them there to tell you what to do like that sort of the thing that's basically what that is. And so I don't like people saying Stockholm syndrome, but still people say that still, and they know what it means. That's the definition of Stockholm syndrome or a trauma bond that she is protecting the guy that is trying to kill her and everyone she cares about the most and like messing up her relationships with the people that like that she does love. Like she was sitting there like trying to argue with Thalia to not kill Luke and to save Luke and what are you doing and things like that too, not even just with Percy. And it's it should be very you should be sitting there like, what do you mean? Like what why would you why are you thinking like this? Why would you why would you want to save him? Yeah. Like what it you should be seeing that and just being so freaked out of like what did he do to you? Yeah. Like make you react this way because it's not how you should be reacting well and let's let's go with annabeth's solution of we take him to olympus we take him alive to olympus what do you think is going to happen he's just going to manipulate hermes like that's what's going to happen if what's going to happen is he would try to manipulate his dad that would be very easy it would be the easiest ever because hermes is a little like person for him at all times but they would just kill him they would just kill him and they should kill him like yeah. they kill him sorry but like somebody like that at who's doing already the things that he's doing in this book is very dangerous and especially considering um the part that we haven't brought up yet is the whole thing of i'm assuming that part of his thing with her was saying like oh we can go to olympus and if we take if you come with me there like trying to make her believe that they could like talk to the gods together or something and like stop things before it gets further but of course at at this point she doesn't know that he has like chronos in like his energy in him which makes him more immortal and i'm pretty sure i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm pretty sure that at this point he also did an initial thing the achilles curse that Percy does in the last book too, that makes him immortal, where if you don't get hurt, hit the certain place in your body, then it doesn't matter. You can like never die. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if he went to Olympus, he couldn't die. And so he would just kill them all, or at least he would try to kill them all. And so it's like, he's 
telling her probably we can go to Olympus and like, you know, make things happen, be a, like, a, you know, negotiate stuff and and get like a peaceful thing. But in reality, he wants to go there so he can kill all the gods because he is as close to a mortal as possible right now. And they don't know that. Mm -hmm. and Annabeth definitely doesn't know that. Yeah. Just like that's actually like scary about how close he was to making that plan happen. Yeah. And they're all together in Olympus right now. So if they go to Olympus right now, he could literally kill all of them mm -hmm. in a way that is not possible. The only time they're all there is during the different the two days of the year that the, that this either the summer or the winter solstice is. That's actually terrifying. Yeah. Of how close he got to making that happen because he just knows what to say to Annabeth. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay, so right after this conversation where she's defending Luke, um, they arrive in Olympus, so Empire State Building. And once they get there, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think where should we start here? We'll just start when they're in the throne room, which um, he says it's a U shape, kind of like all of the cabins. And Artemis welcomes them in, and they see Bessie and Grover are already there. Um, let's see. So Bessie is like swimming around in a magical, like, water sphere. And Grover, one of the first things he says is like, we gotta convince them, like they're gonna they're gonna hurt Lynn. He doesn't really say like they they want to sacrifice Bessie, but that's what he's getting at. That like they're gonna hurt Bessie. <laughs> um, let's see. I love how Grover is like just like hugs Thalia and Annabeth and then to Percy he's like you have to save you have to save them they're gonna kill her and he's like huh and, but also like Percy is the one in this group that will absolutely take on the gods and be like you cannot kill my animal best friend mm -hmm. you can't do that that's not I'm no yeah <laughs> so we get physical descriptions of all of the gods in this chapter um, Poseidon, we've already heard of. He's kind of a, an old, like, sun-tanned dude with um, beach attire, Hawaiian shirt, and um, beach shorts. He has the same green eyes as Percy, same dark hair, which, um, I mean, we've seen the show version. They kind of made him match a little bit more with the hair, at least. Mm -hmm. um, it's a light Hawaiian-themed shirt. If anything, it was more of a camp shirt, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder if they'll go a little bit more Hawaiian going forward, or at least when he's in Olympus. Um, let's see, so we find out Artemis, um, actually, wait, before I get there, another thing is he says that the Olympians all look 15 feet tall. And we did critique this in the Percy Jackson movies, the them looking super tall, but then shrinking down. But it, it, it feels more ridiculous in the movie, and I feel like they're probably not going to take the same approach when they do this show because they really like, didn't imagine it's cheesy. Like Zeus and <laughs> Zeus and Poseidon and Festus in season one are very normal, okay. normal sized. I just think it's so funny that out of everything in Titan's Curse, this is the one thing that the movie people were like, let's put that into our movie. Let's yeah. make gigantic for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it just did not work. Um, yeah, That's so the only, thing that, the only thing that they think matters. Let's make the gods gigantic. Um, Artemis is she basically has informed them everything that happened. Um, let's see. So she tells them that at Zeus's command, her and Apollo are now going to hunt the most powerful monsters before they can join the Titans. Athena will personally check on the other Titans to make sure they don't escape their various prisons. Lord Poseidon has been given permission to unleash his full fury on the cruise ship Princess Andromeda and send it to the bottom of the sea. And as for you, my heroes, these half-bloods have done Olympus a great service. Would any here deny that? 
And this is where Percy takes like a pan look around the room. He sees Zeus in a dark pin suit. Um, we'll skip over the physical description because we already know. Well, actually, we don't know what they're going to do next time because of Lance Riddick. Mm-hmm. But um, next to him is Hera. He describes her as a beautiful woman with silver hair braided over one shoulder and a dress that shimmered the colors of peacock feathers. Um, on Zeus's right was Poseidon. And then next to Poseidon was, he says, a huge lump of a man with a leg in a steel brace. So we have seen their Hephaestus. And um, the only thing is we didn't get a full body shot. So maybe we'll see an actual mechanical device on his leg next time. Um, then we have Hermes. Hermes is also wearing a business suit, and he's talking on his Caducas cell phone. Um, and then he looks over to the lady side. So he says next to Hera is a woman in a dark green robe or dark green robes. And um, her throne is woven of apple tree branches. So he figures this is Demeter. And next to her sat a beautiful gray-eyed woman in elegant white dress. She could only be Annabeth's mother, Athena. Then there was Aphrodite, who smiled at me knowingly and made me blush in spite of myself. Um, So he doesn't go through the full pantheon, but he describes the major ones there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... I feel like maybe we need to skip forward to what ends up happening with this discussion with the immortals, which is that they see these two children, meaning Talia and um, Percy, as a threat in their room. They're like, these kids could take us all down and we need to get rid of this Bessie. Like, we can't have Bessie either. So um, they... And it's it's Ares who first says it, but then Athena agrees with him. And it's interesting because they're the two war gods. So they really are thinking purely battle strategy. I mean, Ares just hates Percy in general. But Athena is calling this a strategic thought. And she's saying, you know, like, it's a big liability. It's a huge risk. Like, shouldn't do it. Um, and eventually Percy does, he's like, are you really afraid of risks? But, um, you know, she wasn't, I don't think she was ready to be called on that right in this moment. No. Um, let's see. I just, I always think it's hilarious. Athena is like, the only way I know how to describe Athena is she's like a mean girl. Mm-hmm. Is that person that is like, oh, I'm just, I'm just saying what, I'm just saying the truth. You can't get mad at me because I'm just saying what's logical and accurate. And it's like you're telling them that you're you should murder these children who just saved your ass. Mm -hmm. And you're like, we should murder them anyway. And also kill this other thing, even though it hasn't actually done anything to us. It just has the capabilities of doing so. But just because you have the capabilities of murdering people doesn't mean you actually will do it. Um, yeah. Anyone can kill them. Like, <laughs> I know that there's obviously like the prophecy with like the big three kids, but it's also like I feel like I feel like it's a very obvious statement to say that you're making really good propaganda for the other side for the fact that you're like sitting there questioning whether you should like kill these children that just like have done everything that you've ever asked them to do because they might hurt you one day, but they're not wanting to do that right now, (laughs) but you still want to take them out anyway. Yeah. Well, and I've told you this story before. I don't know if I've said it on the pod before, but like one thing in healing my golden child trauma with my brother and talking to him about our childhood that he said to me that I never really thought of was, I mean, you have to think we grew up in the 90s. It was shortly after Columbine. And so my brother being a dark brooding autistic guy, um, super into violent video games and all of the things that they thought created monsters, um, people would would joke like, you're going to you're going to turn into that. And he'd be like, OK, but why are you pissing me off then? <laughs> like, And this is almost exactly what's happening here is that they're like, these kids are dangerous. We shouldn't trust them. Let's kill them. 
And he's like, I'm supposed to save you guys. Like, what? Yeah. And that's something that is also relatable to me with, like, your brother, where I wasn't somebody who wore, like, black all the time in the, like, kind of, like, gothy way that people did back then. But I also was a super unpopular kid at school and most of the kids that were really unpopular like me were like poor and had shitty parents that's weirdly why we were unpopular Mm -hmm. um in middle school that weirdly happens and so i remember though that columbine happened when i was in seventh grade and so i remember for the rest of seventh grade and in eighth grade there was this weird thing that especially because columbine the city where it happened or the town is very similar to the town that i grew up in where it's a small town It's a rich, um, predominantly, like, rich area. They, like, freaked out a lot after that happened and changed a lot of rules about who could be in schools and stuff because they were so afraid. And so a lot of the kids that were unpopular like me, they would, the boys, they would, like, say stuff like that to them. And Mm -hmm. it was, like, and I remember defending them, even in high school, to, like, even my friends and other people like that. Like, just because they wear black doesn't mean they're going to do anything like stop talking (laughs) like wearing clothes they're just wearing the clothes that they have at their house i don't know what you are saying right now but it's it's very much that sort of a thought of like you know i'm an unpopular kid you know that everyone hates me here and i don't like coming here i'm poor my parents don't take care of me because i get teased because i don't shower often and things like that um including me like i didn't do that either and so Like, you already know these things about me, so, like, why are you trying to, like, instigate with me on purpose? Like, like when, (laughs) this may sound, (laughs) this may sound interesting, but just, like, go with me on this. But, like, when I was in middle school and high school, like, part of why I always feel sad when I hear stories about kids who end up doing school shootings that are, that are very abusive homes, is that I remember when I was those ages and I would, like, fantasize about doing that. Um, because I just wanted to hurt everybody. I would just like be at school and I, sometimes you just get really angry and you just want people to be hurt because you're so hurt and nobody notices. And you just want people to notice how bad you're hurt because nobody does. And so when I hear stories like that with those kids, I'm like, I feel really bad that they like had the worst people around them that like encourage them to do that instead of having people around them to encourage the opposite to like encourage them to talk about why they're upset or things like that um because it's it is that easy though (laughs) when you're going through at least really bad abuse like that sometimes that just you just think like that sometimes because there's only so long you can put up with that with nobody noticing before you start to like slowly lose it a little bit yeah it's like if you know that somebody is going through that why would you make it easier for them to hate you yeah like you already know what percy's been dealing with in these books so far do you want to make him mad on why would you want to make him mad on purpose (laughs) yeah and so percy and talia haven't spoken up for their own defense yet artemis does though and we talked our shit in the beginning of the book so i think we have to give her her credit a little bit for the character growth she has here because um she says If we destroy heroes who do us a great favor, then we're no better than the Titans. If this is Olympian justice, I will have none of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first thing that Percy kind of, well, sorry. So Zeus says perhaps, but the monster at least must be destroyed. We have an agreement on that. And Percy notices people are nodding. And so he's like, you you can't, you you can't, it's messy. (laughs) And Poseidon's like, you named it. (laughs) Bessie? <laughs> Shut up, this is not important right now, Poseidon. Yeah. Um, why Why would you, and I like that they made the point of Percy going off on them about this, like, you're just, it's just as bad to kill Bessie. Bessie hasn't done anything. Bessie is terrified. Ooh. Everyone just talks about wanting to kill them every time they're around them for some reason. That's all anyone talks about whenever they're around, even though they're terrified of it. They haven't actually done anything. Just because they have the capabilities of doing that if somebody murders them doesn't mean that you should just kill it right now. Mm -hmm. What are you what are you doing? But like this part especially is why I do not give Poseidon credit ever (laughs) 
because Zeus is all like, no, we're going to kill the cow and shut up child. And we're just going to kill the cow. And then Poseidon like says like five words and he gets Zeus to like shut up and go with not killing Bessie. And it's like, you do realize you could do that all the time. Like you can say things to your crazy brother and you could get him to like maybe change some of the rules so that the kids don't have to go through all of this stuff because you obviously are somebody that he has to listen to because you're related to him and you could do everyone a favor and you could be the one to bring this stuff up with him because he has to listen to you and he can't kill you where you stand but instead you don't and you make your son do it instead so i hate you (laughs) like i just i can't like you could do this all the time bro but you don't because i don't know why you just don't and it's just weak yeah well it's i think it was the most scapegoaty thing ever that as percy is advocating on behalf of bessie he is looking Zeus straight in the eye and he's like i know i should have been afraid but i'm not like mm-hmm. i'm really not and um so the line that he says is that killing bessie would be just as wrong as chronos eating his children just because of something they might do which yeah. most of the people in, are not most of them but like a good chunk of the people in that room experienced that directly they were in that stomach you know mm-hmm. like sometimes yeah. you just got to be really blunt with them because that's the only way for them to listen yeah and it's funny that zeus considers this because i mean he's the one kid that didn't get swallowed but um you know like demeter hades poseidon hera I'm trying to think which other ones are old enough i think the rest might be like Zeus's kids. So um, at least those ones, you know, directly were in Kronos's stomach at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So then um, they talk about kind of how they're going to mitigate the damage that these children can do. And Artemis says, like, I have an idea. Um, and so she goes, she whispers in Zeus's ear, And um, she says, I need a new, um, what does she call it? A new companion, a a new right-hand girl. And Percy thinks that she's talking about Annabeth at first. So he's like, Annabeth, like, please. And she looks at him, she's like, you look like you're about to throw up. Like, are you okay? (laughs) And he can't even get out the words, but like, and it's not that I don't think he understands his feelings for her. It's that I don't think he he ascribes the meaning to them that like Aphrodite has tried to or everyone else has tried to yet. He's just like, this is a person I really, really care about and don't want to not be in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah, also like the, I'm trying to think of a way to explain it, but the like obliv- obliviousness thing always bothers me because it's not being oblivious in the way that people think Mm -hmm. it's not thinking that it's possible that somebody would care about you like that Mm -hmm. that's like the kind of scapegoated way that we go through life is it just genuinely doesn't occur to us that people could like us that much that they would even feel that way about us and so it's not that we're like oblivious to our own feelings it's more of just like, I don't think that this is possible for me that somebody would actually want to be with me like that. And so why would I think that that's, why would I think that much about how I feel? Because that's something I'm probably never gonna experience because nobody likes me that much. And that's like more of how it is with him, I think, is like, I, why would Annabeth like me like that? <laughs> um, or like, why would I get something like that when, most of the time it's just not like that and it's it is it sounds really weird but it genuinely is like a thing of like when people say that to you you just kind of like stare at them and you're like what do you mean (laughs) like i didn't think that that was even a possibility for me what are you talking about like it just has never been something that even pops into your mind as even an option um yeah. And so I, I feel like that's more where he is at, at this point and why it takes them a while to actually, at least on his end, to get together when it isn't involving like Luke situations is purely like, oh, I didn't realize that people could like me that much. Yeah. 
Well, um, so this is where Artemis turns to Talia and she's like, you, you're going to be my new lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And um, Talia immediately says, I will. Um, Zeus says, my daughter, consider her well. And like, it's interesting because it's like, does he not want her to? But then he's still proud of her. So it seems like he's not sure how to feel about it either. I, so... One of the things that ha is a thing that happens in these books is that the gods have like this weird, not so weird considering them, but a competition almost of like their kid being the prophecy kid. Like it's almost like a weird, it's a, like a weird bragging rights thing, even though they want to kill Percy all the time. It's also like a weird bragging rights sort of thing with them that they want their kid to be the one that is the one doing it because they want to be able to like use what their kid is able to do to like garner like more power or whatever between the different like siblings and stuff so because there's st stuff like that happens with hades in like the last book where he does something absolutely bonkers to to try to make nico <laughs> be the prophecy child when he's 12 in that book um <laughs> oh my god but he does it because he wants he wants he wants his child to be the prophecy kid so he can like use that power to try to get what he wants in in like olympus and so i'm sure that zeus is making these like little noises that are just like weird sentence fragments during this part because he doesn't want to have to say out loud, like, but I wanted to use you to get more things yeah. from my brothers. And if you join, I can't make you do this stuff for me. <laughs> and so instead he just says nothing. <laughs> yeah. So she takes the oath and then immediately after goes and hugs Percy. And she, um, he's like, wait, aren't you not allowed to do this anymore? And she's like, you're my friend. I, I'm allowed. Um, and um, so she says, uh, well, before that, she says to her dad, I, I will not turn 16 tomorrow. I will never turn 16. I won't let this prophecy be mine. I stand with my sister Artemis. And then to Percy, she says, I haven't known peace since, since half half blood hill meaning when she got turned into a tree i finally feel like i have a home but you're a hero you will be the one of the prophecy and i know you have mixed feelings but i'm going to defend her really quick because it's it's one thing that i think about all the time with currently being no contact with my mom which is i mean part of the problem with my sibling dynamic was me constantly being favored over my brother me constantly being treated better. I've talked a little bit about things like he's had to buy every single car he has. I've been given cars as hand-me-downs. I didn't have to pay for my college. He did. Things like that. And so with me out of the picture right now, I really do think sometimes like he is getting that attention finally. And I know he has the right boundaries that my mom's not going to push him in ways that she pushed me. But they go out and they go to like wineries together they do events together they go to church together it feels like a much better fit than what was happening with me and so me stepping out of the way and letting him have that feels like the right thing to be doing right now you know feels like yeah michael deserves his flowers for being a better adult than i am yeah and well this is one of those things of it's not exactly like a bad decision for Salia in any way. It's honestly the best thing for her, I think, um, to, and it is a way for her to kind of keep some sort of control over what happens to her. Um, that instead of having to deal with the prophecy stuff, she just takes herself out of it completely and has control over at least that part of her life. Like, I don't think she really cared about joining the hunters for like you know companionship or whatever like other people have i think she just this was a way for her to have some sort of control over her fate again um mm -hmm. but it is also just one of those things that is just such a like scapegoat golden child thing that this whole book every god has favored her and is like talked to her with this respect that she hasn't actually earned 
And Percy's earned that respect so many times over, but they treat him so bad. And then at the end of this book, she just is able to just like be like, peace out and leave. And I, I don't, I, like there is no like male version of the hunters, but if there was, and like Percy tried to join and like leave, I think they all would have like lost their minds on him if he mm-hmm. tried to do something like that. And it's just one of those, difficult things to know that like even if he is the right person to handle the prophecy and all that because he's the only one that genuinely cares about everybody and wants to take care of everyone and and like would handle it the best it's still horrible that he has to be the one to actually do it it's still it's just one of those things of like yeah he should be the one to do it But it's still awful that everything that happened between him and Thalia in this book, that it ends with her just leaving and him having to deal with it on top of everything else that happens. Even though he is the best one to handle it, it's still just frustrating that he has to do that. Yeah. um, It's interesting that you say it's a way of her taking back control, because we've said that we think her fatal flaw is, you know, being a control freak. and I, I do have to say, like, the one thing that feels different than all of her actions previously in the book about this is that she always did kind of lean into, yeah, I am the best person for this job. Like, I'm the best person to be the leader of Capture the Flag. I'm the best person to help us navigate as we're going on this quest while she's getting them lost. Like, there, she's tried to step into these roles that she doesn't fit in so many times. This is the very first time she's like, this This isn't mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it does suck that it puts it onto a 14 year old Percy, which then has the gods questioning, okay, well, what do we do about this one? Because there's two years that Kronos has to get his clutches on this one. Yeah, and well, one well, other thing I wanted to say about Thalia too is, I feel like this is like a thing that happens um in the book series in the show too that i thought about when i was re-watching the earlier episodes mm-hmm. is that like luke is like so into going on quests and stuff like that and thalia and annabeth heard that from him so much that going on a quest is like the best thing ever because you get to like prove how good you are and how strong you are and how you're the best and then everybody hears your name and is like afraid of you but like that's literally what he tells Percy in the second episode of the show <laughs> um, of why you do stuff like that and so I feel like this was also Thalia almost like have after she saw Luke and had that whole fight happen it was like almost her being like slapped in the face of like oh this is what this is actually like mm-hmm. like these are like this is like what a quest is actually like this is what a battle during one of these is actually like to experience and i don't want to i don't want to do this anymore and just like realizing like i'm not actually good at this like percy's the one that did all the big things in that fight that like saved everybody he's the one that saved everybody at the museum with the nemean lion and and came up with the plan to get them away from the big monster where bianca died too mm-hmm. and so it's like and also help them when they were at the when they were at the dam. And so it's like one thing to say like, oh, I'm going to be the best become because I'm Zeus's kid. But it's another thing to actually be in those situations and be expected to like follow through. And I think by the time she got to the end, she was just like, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> like, he is so much better at this than me. I like, I give up. <laughs> yeah, well, and I also I hope that for her, this is a step towards more development because, I mean, we've seen she's not great at working on a team. She's not great at cooperation. She's not great at, like, thinking on her toes and maybe training with the hunters and having this group that does work together, that does go out into all these battles, is going to make her a stronger and better fighter. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. Um, So then we have Percy still really only arguing for Bessie's life, Um, which um, he eventually convinces them, like, look, let's just keep the thing safe. We don't have to kill it. Like, and so Poseidon agrees. He says that, you know, like, I can keep it safe in my kingdom. And Zeus is like, 
nah, you're not, you're not getting that big of a bargaining chip. No, no. And so the side was like, okay, we'll build a little tank here in Olympus. Um, one part of that that I thought that I like pictured in my head is I was like, if somebody uses it in the ocean, does it not hurt Poseidon? Otherwise, why do you care about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it's it's only a couple lines that he says while he's like, I'll take care of the creature, where he says, the boy will not betray us. I vouch for this on my honor. And so, yeah, he, he vouches for Percy, but like, it wasn't a, this is a really good kid, and look at all these things he's already done, and look at how he treats the people around him. It's just like, nope, I, he's my son, so I'll, I'll vouch for him, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the other part of Poseidon that always bothers me is that it's like you can't really point out how he like protects Percy because it's more about him protecting like his own place in Olympus instead because it's more like if his son wasn't didn't follow through with like the prophecy stuff and turn against them, it would make him look really bad. And yeah, never just for Percy just as Percy, it's about, like, it is obviously helpful to Percy that he uses his pull in Olympus to scare anyone who would try to hurt him from ever trying to hurt him during these years. Um, so it, I honestly think that's the thing that stops a lot of them from trying to do things to him, especially in, like, Sea of Monsters and stuff, before he even understands why they want to hurt him or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, it's like it's not like a truly altruistic thing because it's more about like the positioning of everyone's position of power in this like hierarchy than anything else. Yeah. Um, so after that is when they take the vote. And so Zeus is like, who's in favor of keeping Percy alive? Um, and Percy says, to my surprise, a lot of hands went up. Dionysus abstained. Aries and Athena, but everybody else dot dot dot. So my my thinking by my count, that's nine out of the twelve that that were like, yes, we will keep them alive. Dionysus being one of them that said no. Like, are you fucking kidding? You're the one, you're supposed to protect them at camp, and you just said, it. and also Annabeth's mom. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get there. Okay, so the next part is, and this is such a weird way to transition from like, are we going to kill him? No? Okay. So um, if we're not going to kill him, I guess we should celebrate. <laughs> yeah. And then they start having a party. <laughs> um, let's see. So Apollo, he says, you can drive my chariot whenever you want. You want to do some archery practice? Like, let's do chariot archery practice. And Percy's like, you, you really don't want me doing that. <laughs> um, let's see. Poseidon approaches him. And um, so there's a couple things that stuck out to me about this conversation that he has. Um, he says, um, your friend Luke. And Percy automatically is like, he's not my friend. I blurted it out. Then I realized it was probably rude to interrupt. Sorry. And then he goes, your former friend, Luke. But then like later in the conversation, he knows that Annabeth had had a conversation with him in the air where he probably shouldn't have seen it or heard it, um, saying, I think Luke is still alive. And he says, I believe Annabeth told you this. So it feels like he has some omniscience but at the same time, you don't know that your son doesn't fuck with this dude. I know. <laughs> so weird. But in this conversation, he says, like, you know, that he really put himself out there and he's nervous about having put himself out there in that way because Hermes did the same thing for Luke. And I mean, this is maybe, maybe possibly another part where they're a tiny bit mirrored. But in the way that, like, I don't know if it'd be mirrored, but like flipped, right? Because Percy, he's worth that promise, but Luke wasn't. And so, um, it, yeah, it, went through that, but it also comes from very different motivations because so a like a theme, a, a term in like therapy world 
is um, a flying monkey. Mm -hmm. And essentially that is somebody that basically like does the work for uh, an abusive person where they kind of go out and like try to convince people to talk to them. They like kind of pass along like their narrative. It's like the people, like if you see it in like real life, it's like if there's a story about an like an, if a victim comes forward, the abusers like friends will go out there and like vouch for them. It's it's that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. Hermes is that for Luke. Yeah, been that for Luke for a really long time. And so that's so like Hermes saying that about Luke is like he, he's trying to like talk nicely about Luke because Luke hates him mm -hmm. and he's like trying to talk to him that way and try to make everybody think how amazing and wonderful and amazing and incredible his son is not only so that maybe Luke will hear how he talks about him, but also to try to like make him look better instead of admitting that his son hates his guts. And yeah. even though he's like the leader at camp and the best fighter at camp. He hates him and doesn't want to talk to him anymore. And like with this, it's Poseidon literally just saying so like, yeah, I, I vouch for you, but it's like, yeah, but Hermes vouching for Luke was him trying to get anything he could out of like, he's literally like that person that is like, acting giving like a nice face when everything is falling apart behind him and is just trying to put on a nice face so that nobody asks enough questions to realize what's actually going on mm -hmm. and so it's like yeah they do the same thing but it's not at all for the same even for the same like godlike reasons like mm -hmm. Poseidon just said that because Percy's his son he's not trying to get Percy to talk to him or be nicer to him or trying to cover up like misgivings that Percy has done because he hasn't done any. <laughs> yeah. In the way that Luke had already done by the time Hermes was saying stuff like that. Well, and the gods do have favorite children sometimes. You know, it's not unheard of, but it's usually favorite for their Kleos. It's usually because they bring so much glory to them as a parent. And at least from what we know here, that does not seem to be the motivation with Hermes. So it's I know we'll probably get to what his motivation for being so pro Luke is, but it doesn't make sense at this point of the story. It's like, why are you vouching so hard for this kid that you have that hates you? Normally, the rest of the gods aren't going to care that their their kids hate them. They're probably just going to like watch them get struck stripped down and like, yeah, they deserved it. Sucks. Well, well, I'll make another one. Yeah, pretty much. That's usually how it goes. So it's like, why do you, why do you care so much about this one kid? Mm -hmm. um, there is something to that that happens later on in like whenever we find out about backstory stuff with Luke, but it still doesn't feel like it's just Hermes being Hermes and like caring about what people think of him, honestly, more than anything else. Yeah. But it's in this conversation with Poseidon, which, like, this is the first time Percy's talking to his dad, and he's just like, yeah, so that guy you don't like is still alive. Um, yeah, remember and, your friend Luke? You know, the guy who tried to stab you to death? Twice. Speaking <laughs> with a scorpion, and, yeah, like, yeah, so um, he says, Luke still lives. I've seen it. His boat sails from San Francisco with the remains of Kronos even now. He will retreat and regroup before assaulting you. I will do my best to destroy his boat with storms. But he's making alliances with enemies, um, with my enemies, the older spirits of the ocean. They will fight to protect him. And um, another thing that comes up in this conversation is that um, Percy asks him, well, like, what's, what's preventing somebody on their team from just taking the burden back from Atlas? And he's like, well, when it comes to the Titans, it like has to be forced upon them. Like you can't, they can't just take it for each other. And um, let's see, hold on, where is the line? He's, let's see, the curse of the sky can only be forced upon a Titan. One of the children of Gaia and Uranus, anyone else must choose to take the burden of their own free will. Only a hero, someone with strength, a true heart, and great courage would do such a thing. Now, I need to go to mythology for a second. So the, the main myth that this one kind of circles around, especially with Zoe, 
is Heracles, I believe it was the 11th labor where he goes to collect the apples of the Hesperides. Now, when he does this, he does it by having Atlas do it. And so he takes on the burden for a bit and Atlas is like, oh, hey, so I'm going to go deliver these apples for you. Um, can you just stay here for a second? And at least in my favorite version of this telling, Heracles is like, yeah, sure, but let me get a cushion for my head really quick and then I'll be right back. And so Atlas is like, oh, yeah, OK. And he takes the burden back and then Heracles just leaves with the apples. <laughs> yeah. um, so like, I would not call that heroic. Um, I mean, like the laborers were atoning for killing his wife and his kids and like his nephews, I believe. And he's just going to deliver apples to a king that eventually need to be returned to the Garden of the Hesperides because they're sacred apples by Athena. So nothing that Heracles did in that taking on the burden was that heroic in my opinion. I mean, in some versions he did try to fight that on, but I, it's, I still have a hard time seeing how he did it as heroic and maybe I'm just like fighting for Zoe in my brain here, but no, it, it is like the perfect sort of myth for them to use like Zoe with because it is one of those things of I can see him coming out of there and being like, I fought Atlas and stole these apples from him and I did all these amazing things. Look at how amazing I am. And I fought him, tricked him. Yeah, and I just like, I did hit all on my own. Nobody else helped me. It was all me. <laughs> like, I can just see how that can be like, and nobody questioned the story because everyone is like, was idolizing him already. And anyone who would think about it, who knows people like this, would think about it for 10 seconds and be like, are you sure? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I couldn't, but I can, it just fits with this whole story about why he is, this story is the one that fit with like where Zoe could, could fit in because that does sound very suspect. <laughs> yeah. And um, Percy never letting a compliment to Luke slide is like, okay, but Luke held it up. Like, Come on. And, yeah, so it's, I feel like he's more the parallel to Hercules here. And all Poseidon can say to that is Luke's an interesting case. And then he pieces out because he sees people playing with the bubble that has Bessie in it, like it's a beach ball. <laughs> um, let's see. So after that, he is speaking to Athena. And um, aye, aye, aye. yeah, so. She says, do not judge me too harshly, half-blood. Wise counsel is not always popular, but I spoke the truth. You are dangerous. And he says, you never take risks. I concede the point. You may perhaps be useful, and yet your fatal flaw may destroy us as well as yourself. Um, so Percy, then he starts thinking, I don't know what my fatal flaw is. Like, what, what is she saying? <laughs> um, so Athena's exact words before I let you go on your rant, because I know it's going to happen. <laughs> Kratos knows your flaw, even if you do not. He knows how to study his enemies. Think, Percy. How has he manipulated you? First, your mother was taken from you, then your best friend, Grover, now my daughter, Annabeth. In each case, your loved ones have been used to lure you into Kronos' traps. Your fatal flaw is your personal loyalty, Percy. You do not know when it is time to cut your losses. To save a friend, you would sacrifice the world. In a hero of the prophecy that is a very that's that is very very dangerous she's very stupid <laughs> and so let me let me explain why i've met so many people like this as athena i feel like every autistic person has met so many people like athena before that they are so sure that they are smarter than you and they don't realize that they're like very stupid and you just are sitting there listening to them and you're like uh-huh sure because you know that it, they're never going to listen to a word you say. Um, so just like to talk about the quest that she's referencing as like his fatal flaw being that he doesn't know when to like, um, you know, let go from like his loved ones. In the first book where he was going after his mother, he left her in the underworld because it was the right thing to do to go and warn all of the gods that Kronos was trying to come back. Mm -hmm. So he had no idea if he would ever see his mother again after that. 
So that sounds like somebody who knew when to cut their losses. And then in the second book, he does go after, you know, um, for um, Grover and everything. But like when they get to the end, he gives the, the golden fleece to Clarice and lets her go and bring it back to camp because he doesn't care if he's the one that does it. Yeah. And then in this book, the same thing, like, yeah, he goes after Annabeth, but he like purposely like does things to make everybody else feel safe and things like that and doesn't put himself first. Like he holds the sky up because he lets other people win the fight that are actually better than him instead of him being the one to do it. Like he didn't run after Luke and try to kill Luke for kidnapping Annabeth or something like that. He let Thalia handle that stuff and what did not have a part in any of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, he actually does know when to like back off or he understands when, when like the things that he's doing, like when the people that he loves, he he's putting them in bad situations. He actively tries to make decisions not to do that. And Mm -hmm. So it's like that doesn't actually make sense when you just think about what he actually is like on these quests because it's also a thing of like is athena trying to say that like him going on all of these quests was like the wrong choice Mm -hmm. like even even in like even in the first book if they didn't take if they didn't have his mom he probably would have gone on that quest anyway and it was definitely the right thing to do it was the right thing to go into the Sea of Monsters to try to get the Golden Fleece back to save camp. It was the right thing to go after Annabeth and try to save her from being killed by Luke. So it's like, are you trying to say that him going on these quests was the wrong thing to do? Like, should he have just left those people and just like said, fuck it and let them die? Like that actively doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it's not like, I don't know how you could possibly say that him deciding to go on these quests, like you literally want him to go. You're mm-hmm. asking him to go. So why are you upset at him when he does what you want him to do? Um, yeah. That's weird. But then also the reason why I say she's very stupid is because of Annabeth. Mm-hmm. Like Annabeth is the one. Annabeth is the one that is like literal putty in Luke's hands. Like, she is the one. Have you, like, ignored... Is she... Like, to me, when I read this scene again, I was like, this is just a mom being like, it can't be my daughter's fault. She's too smart for this. It can't possibly be her, even though it is her. So, obviously, it has to be you, little boy. Like, you have to be the one that's actually the problem because it could never possibly be my daughter because that would make me look bad. My daughter is too smart. And so it's not possible that this could be happening with her, except that it is like Annabeth is her, her, her fatal flaw is definitely like hubris, but the way that it's coming out right now is that she is so sure that she can save Luke Mm -hmm. because she's smart and she just thinks, well, I can save Luke because Luke says he cares about me. And so even though I, he almost just killed me and he's almost killed everyone that I love at this point multiple times. I'm sure that I can just do it because I think that I can. And like, that is, that is actually dangerous. Like that is her her personal loyalty to Luke makes her so easy to manipulate. It's sickening how easy it is for him to manipulate her. And he just continues to do it when he's not even there. She's still fighting like his little battles at, with like Percy and things like that. And at camp and, talking to Percy and all this st- sort of stuff. And so I'm like, actually, I'm pretty sure that it's your daughter that's the super vulnerable one that is making really, really bad decisions because of her personal loyalty. Um, like Percy would never, never in a million years ever try to convince people to bring the villain to the people that he wants to kill. Yeah. Never. He would never do something like that. Like, that would never even cross his mind. Like, he just wants everyone to be safe. He is not the one that is ever in danger of, like, the idea that he's being manipulated by Kronos even is not true because he's not being manipulated by him. Like, he's not choosing to do anything with him. Like, yeah, Kronos has, shows him scary dreams, 
but he, and they freak him out but he never actually considers ever joining him mm-hmm. and so it's like just because he's in that position doesn't mean that he's actually going to listen to him and like considering what he's done this far there's no reason there's no actual reason to believe that he would do that except just it's easier to just not like him (laughs) because but it's it this scene also is just such a slap in the face because the reason why percy keeps going like in life in general is because of the people in his life that he loves Mm -hmm. the other reason why he he like continues to live honestly and so like the idea that especially after everything that happens in this book which is so much that we're doing like an extra episode just to talk about it all because so much happens in this one book that the idea that he goes through all of that he does in this book and then to get to the end for his one of his best friend's mothers to tell him to his face like the thing that has like kept you going all of this time the thing that like gets you through every single battle that you're in where you succeed is actually what makes you really dangerous and it's like the the like connections he has to his friends and his mom and things like that the even just wanting to protect the other demigods at camp they are like everything to him of course like he that's why he does everything that he does and you're telling somebody that one of the most important things about him actually makes him scary and that he would it might be the reason why he turns evil one day like that is so messed up to tell a 14 year old kid like actually the reason why you care about people and the reason why you care so much is secretly the reason why you're going to turn bad one day like it reminds me so much of um sometimes people say things like if you go through abuse when you're a kid that it makes it means that you're way more likely to do it yourself when you're older and it's an oversimplified idea that a lot of abusers were victimized at some point in their life um Mm -hmm. but it that those things get into your head especially when you're first like dealing with everything like i was generally like terrified for many years of my life and there still is a little bit of fear like that every once in a while that i'm gonna like turn into my dad um like my one of my therapists had to teach me how to be angry because i was so terrified i was convinced that if i was angry i was going to turn into him that i would just be like him because he was my dad and if he was that angry then i have no choice but to end up like him and so like he literally had to like walk me through doing it and it scared the shit out of me like it was one of the scariest things i did in therapy so far was to learn how to do that um and like prove to myself just by doing it that i'm not going to turn into him even if i let myself be angry which i'm not but it's like that's that's what that basically is of her saying that to him is like actually the nice thing about you is secretly going to be the thing that makes you evil one day and it's like Everyone is like talking about killing him. Like Annabeth's mom is saying that he's secretly evil. They're all talking about how bad and evil and horrible he is and that he's gonna turn against them one day. And he's just like this kid and he's never done anything that even gives you the idea that he would ever do something like that. Um, But they're all talking about him to his face like that. And those things do affect you. It just makes you feel like there must be something bad about me because if they're all saying this to me they must be right they must be seeing something that i don't see which is basically his response to this conversation is oh athena is supposed to be really smart so she must know more about me than i know about me and it's like no child she's just a horrible person (laughs) and she just is trying to find a way for anything to not be annabeth's fault and that's really what this conversation is but it would he doesn't know that and i'm sure 18 year old percy in the newest book still thinks that his fatal flaw is that he loves people which is just like are you kidding me (laughs) well it's the whole point that i feel that rick riordan is trying to get to with placing percy as is here placing this person who has immense empathy for people who cares about the people close to closest to him so much is that it's not about the deeds. You know, it's never been about the deeds. It's about how you treat people. It's about how you move through this world. And um, 
you don't make your waves necessarily by those big bad things all the time. Sometimes it's what people think about you that really counts. Yeah, and it's also like the way that you use like the power that you do have. Um, like he is like, you know, the prophecy kid in this situation. He's going to this solstice thing, knowing that the gods are going to argue about whether they should kill him or not. And even despite that, he sits there and yells at all of them about protecting Bessie. Mm -hmm. And like, it would be easier for him not to do that because the gods already are wanting to kill him already. Making them angry again isn't exactly going to be going to make that any easier for him, but he does it anyway because he knows that nobody else would do it. And he's using his position as like Poseidon's son, who is this prophesied kid to save this like innocent creature who doesn't deserve to be killed just because of the powers that it has if somebody kills it. And so like, that's what you should do with that sort of position in Olympus is you should use it to try to help people. And that's the thing that actually like really matters and shows like who he really is as a person instead of like all the weird like positioning that everybody else is doing instead of playing these like strategy games of like trying to get ahead he just use he always uses his position in a way of like what can i do to like help the people that i care about because otherwise i don't care about like if people respect me or not necessarily and yeah. that's way more important it's just so silly to say that he's dangerous at this point <laughs> Yeah, so Athena parts ways with him by saying, I don't approve of your friendship with my daughter. And then Annabeth interrupts them and Athena walks off. So that's kind of where we leave off with, oh, well, almost done with Olympus. So in the beginning of the next chapter, Percy makes a few iris calls. He tells Tyson everything that happened. And it's, I thought it was really cute. Tyson was actually happy that his shield broke because he's like, that means it saved your life and I will come and fix it next summer. I've been working so hard. They're going to give me a whole summer off. I'll see you. And I'm so excited for it. And him like being like, I have made exactly 9,200 and whatever. <laughs> like, I, I also just, I loved this part so much too because of Percy being like, wow, I guess I really missed like Tyson. But it's just because Tyson is like this wonderful person in in Percy's life where he just loves him and he's like his like almost like his sounding board person mm -hmm. um like we basically do that for each other all the time but like you need somebody like that that you can just go to and talk about whatever is going on in your life without the other person judging you at all or just like listening to you and and if you want advice giving you advice uh, but other than that just listening to you yeah. And that's what Tyson does, or is for Percy, and it's just very sweet to see him have somebody like that and for it to be somebody like Tyson. Yeah. That is that just is so adorable. It is. And then he calls um, Sally, and she is still with Mr. Blowfist, and um, she kind of, it's almost like she hesitates from telling him, like, hey, I'm in a relationship. Yeah. And he knows she's about to say it, so he's just like, are you happy? Well, I'm glad you're happy. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. He does get to tell her that he saved Annabeth and stuff, but their conversation is super short. She ends it with like, can you please not call him Mr. Blowfish? And he's like, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. We'll think about it. <laughs> yeah. And then they say they're going to see each other for Christmas. He asks for blue candy and then she disconnects from the call. Um, so then they head back to Camp Half-Blood and um, let's see. So they fill people in on what happened there. They, um, they say Clarice is back from her secret scouting mission, but we still don't know what that is yet. Um, and that she has a new scar and that she looks like she has a really bad haircut too. So something went down, girl thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're just not sure. Um, and she said she's got news, she's got bad news. Chiron says he'll fill them in later. Um, so he tells them about, wait, sorry. Um, he says then 
that he's thinking about Rachel. And I feel like this is our foreshadowing for the next book that she's kind of a bigger player in it, that we're not done with her because we really only did get that one chapter in the Hoover Dam and like two other mentions of her. So the thing that I hated about that part is I was like, yeah, this is like a, a thing for Rick to bring that in to remind people of her when she shows up in the next book. But also what Percy is saying during that part is like, he's thinking about people like Rachel and that without her, he would have died. He's literally thinking about how nothing that he's done is actually because of him. That mm -hmm. is because of other people. He's literally like beating himself up like a good scapegoat does and thinking like, I didn't actually do anything myself. It's all these other people around me that constantly save me. Nothing happened actually because of me. I didn't actually do anything. It's only because of people like Rachel that I ever actually succeed at anything at all. Yeah. I'm like, Gabe, stop talking. Stop talking in Percy's head. Stop it. <laughs> because that's that's where that stuff comes from. But I read that and I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> like, why does he have to be so accurate to this experience? Because that's the exact, like, things we think all the time <laughs> yeah so then um he tells them luke is still alive and this is where we get more annabeth bullshit because she says if the final battle does come when percy is 16 at least we have two years to figure something out i had a feeling that when she said figure something out she meant get luke to change his ways um so like i mean she didn't directly say it but he's reading between the lines he knows her well enough she said it the entire way back to Manhattan. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it is actually not two years. It's more like a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, it was not even a full two years, but also, oh my God. <laughs> that, that, that is out of like the last like week of her life. That is what she's come out of it saying. I have another two years to save the guy who just tried to kill me. I can't wait to figure this out. <laughs> Yeah, and well, here's another thing that, like, I feel like it flies in the face of the people that trying to say Luke isn't that bad, is Chiron explains why he thinks that he's coming for Camp Half-Blood, which is um, gods use heroes as their tools, destroy the tools, and the gods will be crippled. Luke's forces will come here, mortal, demigod, monstrous. We must be prepared. Clarice's news may give us a clue as to how they will attack. Um, and then he gets interrupted because Nico comes in. God. <laughs> so um. with everybody get, goes dead silent after Nico walks in and Percy, he realizes nobody's told him. And he's like, shit, I have to be the one to tell him. Um, Nico, let's go take a walk. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up that is something that you won't remember because it's so many books ahead of this, but when the way Nico walks in and he's like, and he's like, where's Bianca or like, where's my sister? Um, much, much later on, another character that they all love and makes everybody sad dies in the Trials of Apollo series. Another, a different character walks in and it's like, where's Jason? And it's like the same thing. And everyone is like, why did you do this to us twice? <laughs> when we had to watch like a person who doesn't know that he's gone have to be told that one of their, the closest people in their life is dead. Um, this scene was bad at, I, so before we even go into this scene, I did not even remember that there is other parts of the scene after he tells Nico and he gets upset. I did not remember anything else. <laughs> past that like i was reading this being like i don't remember any of this so like wow i just like totally blocked all of that out yeah god yeah so um thus he took the news in silence which somehow made it worse i kept talking trying to explain how it happened how bianca had sacrificed herself to save the quest but it felt like i was only making things worse and then he gives him the figurine. He says, she wanted you to have this. Um, but Nico's just kind of like staring at it like, okay. Um, and um, the first thing that he says is that 
is you promised you would protect her. And I know fandom depicts this like so much more dramatically than it is in the books. I feel like Rick didn't even feel the need to put in the dramatics of like Nico sobbing or anything like that. But imagining a 10 year old, like you promised me, even if he's not crying, it's going to hurt, you know? Um, and Percy yeah, says, just, just, might as well stab me. Just picture like Walker's version of Percy standing there with like a 10 year old kid talking so much because he doesn't know what to say. And he's trying to somehow explain how his sister died and he wasn't able to save him. It's just like, what are you supposed to say to that? Like, what do you even, how do you even talk about something like that? Mm -hmm. And what are you supposed to say to when they're like, why didn't you save her? And it's just like, especially when he tried so hard to do that and it just didn't work. Because yeah. Oh God. And so Percy's trying to explain he tried, Bianca gave herself up because like really Bianca ran for that foot, you know, like Percy wanted to be the person to go in, but he didn't get there before her. She was the one like, this is all my fault. I'm going to go. And, um, so Nico goes on, um, you promised I shouldn't have trusted you. You lied to me. My nightmares were right. And Percy says, wait, what nightmares? Um, and so this is where it really starts falling apart because he takes the statue, which is the thing his sister died for, and throws it on the ground, says he hates him. And Percy says she might still be alive. Like, and you know, we, we all felt that reading that scene because they just didn't find her. What if her body is still in there? What if she's still in the foot of that robot thing and they just don't know where the foot is? Um, you know, the, the wording was lost. It wasn't necessarily dead. And I know dead can mean lost, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we find out, I know later in the series that like, he wasn't just lost, but here we don't know. And um, so he says she's dead. Um, his whole body trembled with rage. I should have known it earlier. She's in the fields of Asaphotl, um, standing right before the judges right now being evaluated. I can feel it. And for him to like evoke such a, like really strong underworld imagery, again, you should be questioning who these kids' parents are. Um, and he says, what do you mean you can feel it? Before I can answer, I heard a new sound behind me. And that's when the teeth dragon things, the dragon teeth soldiers come back after them. And Nico thinks that this is Percy setting him up because he is just, his world has been turned upside down. He thinks this kid who promised him everything just betrayed him. And so he's like, oh, so you want me dead too. And um, wait, the way he said it was you brought these, these things and um percy's like no i mean like yes they followed me but no yeah and he's just like get out of the way so i can try to stop them so they don't hurt you small child and he says yeah i don't trust you um so percy's trying to fight them they're doing the same thing that they did when he tried to fight them before which is they're falling apart and coming back together and he's telling Nico to run, go get help. And Nico says, no, hands to both ears, like very much a little kid tantrum. And that's when Percy feels the ground start rumbling. The skeletons froze. I rolled out of the way just as a crack opened at the, the feet of the four warriors. The ground rippled apart like a snapping mouth. Flames erupted from the fissure and the earth swallowed the skeletons in one loud crunch. So Percy at this point is like, oh shoot, I think I know who his parent is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he tries to ask him, how did you, but Nico's still so just distraught. He's like, no, get away from me. I hate you. And um, I wish you were dead. And then let's see, Percy slips on the statue and 
He realizes the statue is of Hades, and that's why it kind of looked familiar. Um, and I think Nico just runs off, right? Yeah. Yeah, Nico ran down the steps heading towards the woods. That's when he tripped. Okay. So what's interesting is after this happens, after he's like, well, shoot, that's Hades' kid, um, he sees Annabeth and Grover. They help him search. He tells them that he's pretty sure this is a Hades kid. And Annabeth is the first one to be like, we have to tell Chiron. But Percy says no. And he wants them all to keep it a secret that Nico is Hades' child. Um, so Annabeth says, a son of Hades, Percy, do you have any idea how serious this is? Even Hades broke the oath. This is horrible. And then, you know, Percy says the timeline bit that we're not sure that he broke the oath. It could have been before the oath because these kids have been in the Lotus Casino. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. She and Nico were stuck there for decades. They were born before the oath was made. Although I'm not sure that we know that for sure. Well, no. If the last president she remembers is FDR, then yeah, she yeah. would be. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. Um, and the reason that Percy gives for, you know, like, ultimately not thinking it's a good idea to tell anybody is, A, I'm going to turn 16 first, so it doesn't matter that he's Hades' child because this prophecy is going to be mine, which is a direct contrast to what just happened with Talia. Um, him saying, you know, I want to take on this burden so this child doesn't have to, even though the child was just like, I hate you, I want you dead. Yeah. Oh, God. There's just so much about this part. Um, first off, that this is like Percy's actual fatal flaw in action, which is like self destruction. Mm -hmm. That he's willing to. It's not surprising to me that his reaction to like almost like not knowing what to do with this sort of info. Like in Percy's mind, he thinks that he's responsible for Bianca dying. And that it's his fault that Nico ran off. All of that is his fault. And so to him, it's like, well, this is my fault that this ever happened. And so I should just deal with this instead. And they're sitting there being like, I remember at this part, Grover is like, he's like a powerful kid that wants to kill you. And you don't want us to tell anybody that he's out there. Like he could find you and hurt you. And he's just like, yeah, whatever. Like it's my responsibility. He's literally like, yeah, if Nico tries to find me and hurt me, um, I'll just deal with it because it's my fault anyway. That's basically what's going on here. And he just wants the, like, it's just a very abused kid thing to be, think that something is your fault that isn't actually your fault. And so your reaction is to just keep it a secret from everybody, even though you know that there's no way that it's actually going to be kept a secret from everybody that at some point people are going to find out, but you just don't care. You're just like, no, this is just what I do. I just keep things secret from people when there's something going on that I don't know how to handle. Um, like and that's, that's what I did with Gabe too. And so that's what he's going to do here. And it's, and it's just horrible that he thinks that, <laughs> that he's like, yeah, uh, um, obviously what happened with Nico is all my fault. And so, we're just not going to tell anybody about it and I'll just deal with it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and it is like a thing that is scary that the gods, it would make everybody, the gods get all dramatic again to find out that Hades was hiding his kids uh, when they made the pact that he just like hid his kids in this casino um, mm -hmm. instead of actually dealing with it um, to try to hide them from existing instead of telling them at the time that he had kids already out there. He just was like, just go in here. Um, but it is, and then on top of it, just this whole interaction is just like, oh my God. Like the the part when, when Annabeth is like, when he's like, no, the prophecy is mine. And they're like, are you like, why? No, like, why, why do you want it to be yours? And he's like, it's just mine. And Annabeth is like, do you want to like have to like hold the fate of the entire world? And it's like, no, but it's gonna happen anyway. 
Mm -hmm. So we might as well just like accept it now because why try? It's obviously going to be me. I was just like having flashbacks to my own life of being like, why bother fighting it? It's always going to come down to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it now because it's always going to be me. Yeah. And I'm sure another thing you can relate to is Annabeth says, if Luke gets a hold of him and Percy just stops her and says, Luke won't, I'll make sure he's got other things to worry about, namely me. Uh huh. Of him. That's literally me and my sister's dynamic. The first like 18, whatever years of my life, a longer than that, but especially at least the first 18 years was like, oh, if, if, if I just like do whatever my dad says, which I'm like pausing because of what that actually means. Um, then he'll leave my sister alone. And, and that's, and then that's fine. Even though he's doing it to me, whatever, I don't care. And like, yeah. not even whatever, I don't care, whatever, I don't matter. And so like, if I can protect her, then everything's fine. And that's basically what he's doing here. And all of this, because it's not his fault. <laughs> It's Artemis's fault. She's the one that that groomed this 12 year old little baby child to join her before she even knew what she was doing. Mm -hmm. It's not his fault at all, but he's just like self destructing and like, because of everything that happened in this book and like Annabeth is sitting there still now being like, what about Luke and everyone can save Luke and we have more time to save Luke and it's like, I don't know why you wouldn't feel this way. After yeah. what happened in the last like week of his life, why wouldn't he be like, I clearly don't matter. Everyone wants to kill me anyway. Nico is just somebody else who thinks that I should be murdered. Uh, so I might as well just like deal with this on my own because whenever I try to ask anybody for help, they don't help me. Mm -hmm. So I, it's just gonna be me. And it's just like, <sighs> and like just Nico doing all of this stuff, you just want to die because he's so little. Uh, and I genuinely don't know where he's going. Like, yeah. I know where he ends up, and it's fucking horrible. In the next book, what happens to him, like, where he is, it's really bad, but it's just, like, you're just like, where, child, like, where are you going? Like, when they come back to Chiron and tell him, and Chiron is like, oh, I hope that he dies in the woods instead of being getting stuck with like Luke's army. And I'm like, yeah, that actually would be better if instead of being like tortured, you know, by Luke and stuff, but, and like, those are like the only choices really that they think is possible. Um, but it's just like, he's 10. Yeah. He's just like gone. And, and you can, you're never upset at him because he's such a tiny little kid, but it's just so hard that he, he hates Percy for just because he's there. Like mm -hmm. Percy is the one that tells him about these things. And like, there are moments many, many years in the future. Um, it's like five books from now that, that like actually more than that, probably where Nico actually talks to Percy about this sort of thing of telling him like, I'm sorry for, putting all of that on you. I never should have done that. And up until that point, like Percy was just going through his life thinking that all of that was his fault. <laughs> um, and so Nico finally at that point when he's like 15 or something, no, he's he's younger than that, but whatever. Um, by that point, he finally tells Percy that stuff of I'm sorry that I put that on you and did that. And when I shouldn't have like, you weren't actually responsible. You didn't actually do anything. It wasn't actually your fault but he's just like an easy it's just one of those hard things where percy already doesn't have much of self-esteem and so this little kid is using him basically as an outlet to take out all of the grief and anger he has about what happened to his sister onto him and because he doesn't have much of a belief about his worth anyway he just he just like lets him do it and it's just like okay that's fine um like, I don't know if anybody would have fought Nico too much about that, no matter who it was, because he's such a little kid. Yeah. This is one of the things that makes it more sad is that it's Percy who would be like, yeah, you're right. Like, it, he's like one of the only characters in this book series that wouldn't try, wouldn't even in their own head, 
try to like defend himself, he'd be like, yeah, you are right. It is my fault. Mm -hmm. And it's just so tragic that he's the one that he's doing that with. And he's tried so hard to like, Percy always tries so much to try to help Nico and just try to be there however he can. And it did, it's very rocky <laughs> for yes. the next like two books. It's not easy at all. Um, there's many times where, where Nico like betrays him and goes after him and does things like that with him. And he just like lets him and never try it just is always there to try to try to help him whenever he can um it's just one of those great things he's on like one of the best things in a weird way is that nico did this with percy because percy is somebody who knows like who understands like what he's going through in some way and mm -hmm. understands enough to like know how to like hang in there with him and just kind of know like i'm okay with him hating me right now and I just hope that one day we can, like, you know, get along and it won't have to be like this. Um, yeah. Because, like, it's not... There's stuff that happens in the next book where he's actively making choices because he's like, I can't let Nico be the one to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if he hates my guts right now and wants to kill me. It doesn't matter. I, he's just going to do that stuff anyway because I'm like, I'm never going to leave to drop this sort of prophecy on a 12 year old kid. Like yeah. no matter how upset I am about other things going on with him. And it's just, you're just sitting there like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> like, just like imagine like a, the TV show series ending with a scene like this. Ugh. Yeah. Like, anyway, bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we get right into after that, like, oh, the, you know, the next big thing's not going to happen until next summer. Everybody's making their plans to leave and stuff. But yeah, it's just, it feels like everybody but Percy has just glossed over the fact that this kid lost his sister twice in a way. Yeah. First to the hunters and then to actual death. And like the thing, too, to keep in mind, like timeline wise, is like the Sea of Monsters happened like three months ago. Mm -hmm. and all of this happened and next summer is in like six months because this yeah. is christmas time and so it's like within like a year three like three of the books happen basically it's like really close together <laughs> of mm -hmm. all of this stuff happening and so they're just sitting there like we just have to wait until like the winter is over before we know like what luke is gonna do they know he's gonna attack him but they're just having to sit there and like wait until they can figure out how that is gonna happen yeah um, it's just like that sort of like dread i guess of like they know luke is gonna attack but they don't know when they these kids know that nico is out there somewhere and is a really powerful demigod and hates percy so they never know when he's gonna like pop up and what he's gonna be doing now that he's just like run off from camp and nobody knows where he is <laughs> and it's just like okay this is such a lovely, like, if, when you think about it, especially, like, the second book ends with, like, Thalia coming back and, and Tyson making him his shield and, like, happy fun times. And, like, this book ends with Nico screaming at him and running away and him being like, it's fine if this 10-year-old kid kills me because it's my fault anyway. Mm -hmm. I am now going to accept doing the prophecy where I might get stabbed to death. Yeah, and there's a lot of what ifs with Nico too, because he's the only Hades child right now, you know, like he's, he's literally the only one. So I don't know how familiar they would be with his powers, like maybe Chiron has some ideas and, and Dionysus, but none of the campers would know what they're up against when it comes to a Hades child. Percy doesn't know what he's up against. Annabeth maybe has vague ideas, but like, you know, with them keeping it a secret amongst the three of them, like, they don't know what danger that Nico could potentially be either. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the end part of this, like, Annabeth says that she wants to, like, say something to Percy and then doesn't because Grover comes out talking about Pan. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just one of those things of, like, I don't know what you could say to him in this moment exactly. Yeah. Like, I generally don't know what she could possibly say right now. Besides, like, she obviously has known since she's met him that he was going to be the prophecy kid, most likely, and what that would actually mean. 
And now that it's here, honestly, most of what Annabeth does, the bit we get of her in this book and the next book is she's basically just like, just refusing to accept what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. It sees reality and she's like, what if I just ignore that and think something different because I don't know. And that's like what like Athena reminds me of is like somebody who's just like, well, I don't like this reality. And so if I just think about it enough because I'm really intelligent, maybe I can just make it be something different than what's actually happening because I don't want to deal with it. And that's basically Annabeth. And it is like a very, it's a stereotypical thing to happen to like a girl, especially who's smart, is to just not realize almost like people just expect you because you're smart or intelligent or whatever that you can like handle things or that you aren't falling into these traps that other people do because they think that you somehow wouldn't mm -hmm. um it's like she's just like every other person she's just like every other girl and she's being used the same way that any other girl would be it doesn't matter if she's intelligent um her emotions are can still be manipulated the exact same way as everybody else Sometimes being intelligent like that makes you more susceptible to that because you just think that like they couldn't possibly be manipulating me because I'm too smart for that. I, if if they would be doing that, I would notice. Yeah. Sort of thing. But she doesn't notice. And I think that's part of the like the like, I don't know the right word for Annabeth, but it's just like I know that she doesn't actually I know that she cares about Percy more than she cares about luke when it really comes down to it i know that she does but she doesn't act like it yeah and, and it's like it's that whole thing of when you're being used by somebody like this or abused by somebody like this you start doing things that are just like totally out of character and you almost don't even know how you got there mm -hmm. and you're just standing there like why did i say that or like why did i do that why did i act like that that's not actually what I think, or that's not actually what I believe, but I somehow said that, and I don't know why I said it. I feel like I can't take it back now, now that I said it, but you're almost like confused by the, by your own decisions. And you're just sitting there like, what am I doing? Like, I feel like that's what she's feeling right now of like, what am I doing? Like Percy just agreed to do the prophecy. And all I can talk about around him is how to save Luke. And it's like I feel like she's sitting there like what is what am I doing with like my life but she has no idea how to fix it because she's nowhere near ready to like realize that Luke is not coming back um <laughs> yeah so that was a lot emotionally for the last <laughs> four chapters of the book yeah where we leave off the the kind of clues we get for next book and i mean my copy was written like when battle of the labyrinth was already out so it has mm -hmm. like you know like a yeah. first chapter but um it, we know lou or we know luke is coming next summer we know nico is a hades child and we have a final scene where grover's like i was playing in the parlor and then i heard pan and so we know that he's going to be closer to that quest because he's had to put it on hold for the last two books First, he was, you know, pretending to build some sort of like wedding shroud or something for Polly Femus. And then in the next one, um, you know, this whole one, he was on the adventure with the hunters and, or I mean, at least with Zoe, Bianca, and Talia. So he hasn't had time to continue this search. You know, he was out helping them scout other half bloods even before that. So the fact that he gets this big hint is definitely like oh hey this thing that we've been talking about for three books off and on it's gonna come into play <laughs> it's finally about to happen yeah yeah so um it's getting pretty late so um we probably should wrap it up there's no like huge cast news um d23 still coming up um in brazil and um yeah we're we both have been speculating there's going to be more casting announcements once that happens but we won't know until it happens um and then we're not going to start battle of the labyrinth right away we decided because shannon's been like single-handedly fighting luke apologists for the past week <laughs> that we're going to have another episode on grooming um 
specifically to talk about whether like or well, well we'll talk about luke as a groomer but we'll talk about whether or not luke was groomed because that is an argument that people say and while there is some merit to it um it doesn't quite excuse everything that he goes through mm-hmm. it's and honestly one thing to talk about too is um i think it's fascinating that a lot of the people who make the videos that i've been that it just like show up and i have to see um that are saying things about him a uh, positive things about him is they talk about him they're like oh he's 19 and i'm like do you know that he is and that he was only 19 in the first book he is 20 in the second book he's 21 in this book he's 22 in the next book when he tries to get annabeth to run away with him and he's 23 in the last book when he asks her if she's in love with him Mm-hmm. And so he get like, it's a tactic that people do in real life with like real abuse of people is they talk about their age as if like, oh, they're so young and they were just like making some silly mistakes. Oh, they're only 19. Like I see people do that with even abusers now where they're like, oh, they were like, you know, 20 something then. And I'm like, yeah, like five years ago, mm-hmm. but they're not that age anymore. But it's a way of like, like babying them almost or like in like infantilizing them by being like oh well they're just like a kid so you can't take anything seriously that he did and it's like a 19 year old knows what he's doing to a 12 year old in the first book anyway but every year he gets older he is more and more aware that what he's doing is wrong because he does more of it and he gets older and it's just one of those fascinating things i see that people say and they also talk about I want to defend his mom, which may sound weird, but people talk about his mom as if like his mom was like abusive or something like that. She wasn't. His mom was a good mom. She just something horrible happened to her that made her like severely like mentally ill. Mm -hmm. She was not a bad mom. And so like he doesn't. People talk about his childhood as if it's like the worst possible one, which is something that happens with abusers too, is people tend to exaggerate like Mm -hmm. their, what their trauma is because they're trying to, they're trying to find a way to explain them. And they're like, oh, well, obviously they did this. So they must've gone through something really bad. And it's like, or they're just a shithead. Mm -hmm. You just, because honestly, when you like, we'll go through it, but when you look at luke's childhood it's not as bad as you would imagine it to be the way that people talk about it and also just because of the things that he does because it doesn't actually excuse anything that he does yeah same way that it does with anybody else like my dad had a shitty dad does that mean what he did to me was okay no 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 (laughs) and so like But that is the stuff that happened with me growing up was people would like concentrate more on him. They would be like, oh, what about his like life or what about what happened to him? What about I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. (laughs) Like, I don't I don't care. Um, That's, I guess, why it's worth it to talk about it is because. It's genuinely like scary to me to see like somebody who's 28 years old. Um, so they can't even say that they're like young and they think that they just like think that charlie is hot or something um is like sitting there saying that luke isn't a groomer he isn't a predator um he isn't a pedophile he isn't any of those things and in like the comments they're like oh i think that rick put that part in in the last book anyway because annabeth kept talking about how she was attracted to him and i'm like so you're blaming his victim Mm-hmm. for him pre- proposing basically to her you're blaming his victim and saying well oh you're just being a girl and you're talking about your feelings too much so he had no choice but to respond to them like do you hear what you're even saying right now it like ugh, it just that's like generally scary because people say that kind of stuff in real life and it's like you're talking about this about a fake person. How do you talk to people in your life that go through things like this? Cause I'm now scared. Yeah. <laughs> and like, granted that person who said that blocked me, 
uh, uh, because I didn't even say anything like, you know, I wasn't being mean or anything like that. They were just in like their comment section. Somebody was trying to say, um, like, oh, I can understand why Luke wanted to do what he did. And I was like, you understand why he wanted to become a god and like rule the world with Kronos? Because that's what he actually wanted to do. Like, let's not pretend like anything else. And that's when she responded and said, like, read the books again. And I like recorded a video. And while I was recording the video, she blocked me. <laughs> but yeah. I was like, um, are you, you didn't look at my profile if you're telling me to read the books again. <laughs> I'm reading them right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just read the scene where he said he wants to go after Camp Half-Blood and Crono, or Chiron says most likely because he wants to take out campers because the Olympia, or because, yeah, because that's the Olympians' tools. And so he wanted blood. He wanted a bloody revolution. He wanted to take out the people who he has been living with and training with for years for nothing <laughs> than more power. And this is like a crossover with like real life about how people talk about politics, especially right now with like <laughs> the idea of like being radical or revolutionary or whatever is like if your version of a revolution is just murdering a bunch of children because they are important to the people that you want to upset you are now the monster mm -hmm. like you are now the bad thing you are now the scary thing you aren't a radical anymore you're not doing a revolution like if you're willing to kill innocent people in order for your revolution to happen like in the way that people talk about politics right now if you're willing to let that man become president because you think that that would somehow do something because you don't care what would happen to black and brown indigenous people well if when he's president because it's all for the greater good because only white people say shit like this and so like if you're willing to do that you have a problem because like if your own if the only way to like beat powerful people like that is to kill innocent victims or even think about doing that then you're not who you say you are. And that's like the stuff that's like, it's so, it seems so obvious to me that like, if he really was doing this to try to help demigod children, he wouldn't be trying to genocide them all off the planet. Like he was already trying to doing that in Sea of Monsters. He was trying to wipe out all of camp. And now he's, he's just continuing on with that same idea. And it's like, if, if you really were trying to help them succeed and you really were doing it for them, you wouldn't be doing this to them. Mm -hmm. And like, that's why Percy is successful is because he actually does care about the demigods and he does want to help them. And so he comes up with ways to help them in a way that's actually helpful and not killing them all. And so it's like, if that's your response is like, oh, I have to do the greater good and have to kill everybody. So nobody is left. And that would then make me supreme ruler. <laughs> um, it's just like, that's, Obviously, the thing that you're actually wanting is for you to be in charge. Mm -hmm. Because it's like the number one thing about being a revolutionary, I to me anyway, is wanting things to happen for the good of everybody, not just the good of you. And everything that Luke does is for the good of himself and nobody else. Yeah. Just because he wants his life to be better. Like, that's why Percy is an actual person like that, because the thing he does is something that he already has like percy doesn't need child support what? he got he was you know claimed as soon as he got to camp and so he said that because he wants everyone else to have the experience that he had mm -hmm. and, it, and like he doesn't have to do that because he already he got that but he's doing that because he wants everyone else to have that as well and that's that's like what you should actually be doing if you actually care about people like that and i don't know the other day I saw a very big account literally write a fan fiction saying that Ty that he, that Percy um, resented Tyson in Sea of Monsters and that Luke turned against the gods because he felt bad seeing the kids in the Hermes cabin never get claimed. Neither one of those things are ever actually said in anything. Mm -hmm. It's literally fan fiction you're writing to make Luke look good and Percy look worse. Percy is never resentful of Tyson. He resentful of everyone else. 
treating Tyson like garbage. And by the way, them treating Tyson so bad is a direct reflection of Luke because he is the one who is in charge of camp. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to be like him and everyone is treating Tyson so badly. And like that just shows the kind of person he is that he doesn't care about beings that he sees as less than him. Because yeah. I am quite sure, like, because the years that Percy is the one that everyone looks up to at camp, they don't treat people like that. Mm -hmm. There's none of that in, like, the later books. They don't do they don't do stuff like that to, like, other beings or kids or whatever that show up at camp like that. Yeah. It's just been wild. I can't believe, like, the crazy things that I've seen from people from that one sound. And I'm like, you're like just saying this. Nobody's <laughs> making you write it. <laughs> but you're just putting it out there and you think that it's like a hot take. <laughs> it's just like, wow, I'm concerned now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get into that a lot more next week. Um, but yeah, that's our plan. And we've talked about potential other episodes um, between books. So um, we'll keep you guys posted on what we're doing before we head into the um, the Battle of the Labyrinth, as always called. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.